Okay, wonderful. Well, welcome everybody. It's always nice to, to see y'all virtually or in person. Um, we'll go ahead and call the meeting to order and we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. So um, if everybody can just virtually stand and say the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic, the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, I just want to go over um, a little bit of the meeting guidelines. The IRL Council Board of Directors is holding this publicly noticed quarterly meeting as a virtual Zoom meeting pursuant to Executive Order 2069 issued by the Office of Governor Ron DeSantis on March 20, 2020, and Executive Order 2150, which extended Executive Order 2069. The Indian River Lagoon Council invites general public comments at agenda item number six. The IRL Council has always encouraged active public participation in our meetings. And to ensure that commitment continues, I will invite public comment with each board action item that requires a vote. To ensure that the virtual meeting record is clear, uh, we'll be taking a roll call vote for each agenda item that requires a vote. Um, and at this time, I would like to ask Kayleen Wheeler to call roll for the board member attendance and to go over um, our housekeeping guidelines for the meeting. Chris Desbosco. Chris? I have lost visual, so I actually need to hear you. I lost my thing. Uh, here. <laughs> Jackie Thurlow Lipich. Here. Stacy Hetherington. Good morning, I'm here. Kurt Smith. Here. Billy Wheeler. Here. Doug Bornick. Here. Oh, Jason, I'm going to kill your last name. Jason Andreata. That was perfect. Here. Thank you. Susan Adams. Here. Okay. So please note that this meeting is being recorded, video and audio. audio. Additionally, all chat conversations will also be recorded and preserved for public record. As we adjust to the online meetings, we wanna share the following logistic information. All attendees are muted and must be unmuted in order to be heard. For those participating via computer, the raise hand tool is an icon at the bottom of the screen or can be found by clicking the participants box. For those participating via phone, dial star nine. The meeting host will see a list of everyone who wants to speak and will unmute and call on those individuals one at a time. Attendees will remain muted until specific moments on the agenda when public comment is accepted. Members of the public who wish to give public comment will be unmuted to speak one at a time. To indicate that you want to speak, use the Zoom raise hand tool when the meeting gets to the public comment agenda item. Prior to speaking, all public comment speakers are requested to please state your name and residence or affiliation for the record. All right, with that, we will move on to item number three, which is, is introduction of Council Board of Directors and special guests. So on with us today, we have Doug Bornick. Welcome, Doug. Thank you. St. John's. We have Chris Zadowski, St. Lucie County. Welcome, Chris. Stacy Hetherington with Martin County. Good to see you, Stacy. Good to see you as well. We have uh, Jackie Thurler Lippich with South Florida. Good to see you. South Florida Water Management District. I'll do the whole thing. Sorry. Good to see you, Jackie. <laughs> Good to see you too. <laughs> We have Kurt Smith um, with Brevard County, who is monitoring some of our, um, actively monitoring our lagoon as we speak, I believe. Welcome, Kurt. And we have um, Aaron Watkins is unable to make it today, but we do have Jason Andriotti, who's the director of the Southeast District with FDEP. Welcome, Jason. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And then we have Miss Billy Wheeler with Volusia County. Good to see you, Commissioner Wheeler. 
um, and then myself, Susan Adams with Indian River County. And on the line, we have Jennifer DeMeo, uh, Region 4 with the EPA. Good to see you, Jennifer. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. And then um, if there's anybody else that's on the line, uh, guests that I've missed, please raise your hand and Haleen will unmute you. Commissioner, we've got uh, Vince Bacaland from uh, EPA headquarters on the line with us as well. Oh, that's correct. Welcome, Vince. Thank you for joining us. I'm sorry I missed you. No worries. Thank you for having me. Good to see you. All right. With that, we will, if there's nobody else, we will move on to the agenda revisions. Um, I would like to... Uh, add um, an agenda item 12E when I was doing some with the staff briefings, a question kind of arose due to COVID that I, and some other issues that I wanna address with the board regarding um, operational and leadership issues. So if it's okay with everybody, we can add that under 12 as item 12E under new business. And other than that, are there any other additions or deletions to the agenda? Seeing none, um, can we have a motion to approve the agenda as amended? Madam Chair, I'll, this is Stacey Hetherington. I will move approval of the agenda with the addition of uh, item 12A. I'll second it. This is Jackie Thurlow Lippish, South Florida Water Management District. Thank you. We do have a motion and a second. Um, I'm just gonna do an all in favor on this one. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Motion carries. Thank you. And um, with that, we'll move on to, let's see, resolutions, recognitions. We have none this meeting. Uh, so we'll move on to public comment. I'd first like to begin with Jennifer DeMeo, Region 4 EPA. Good morning, everyone. Um, we wanted to let council know that based on Indian River Lagoon NEP's grant application, uh, dated May 1st, 2020, to the EPA, um, the United States, acting by and through the United States Environmental Protection Agency, awarded $662,500 to the IRL NEP for FY21. So, as always, EPA agrees to cost share 50% of the approved budget period cost incurred. Um, I wanted to thank the IRL NEP, especially Daniel Kolodny, for his diligence in ensuring that the IRL NEP's application was submitted not only a month ahead of the deadline, but was the first application received by Region 4. And knowing that the region follows the first in, first out process, the IRL NEP was the first to be awarded and I believe remains the only NEP to be awarded at this time in Region 4. So this preparedness truly places Indian River NEP in an excellent position for FY21. So a great congratulations and a huge thank you um, to IRL and the IRL staff. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention was we wanted to take this opportunity to remind our partners um, about the South Florida Geographic Initiative, RFA, that's currently open, and it closes, <clears throat> excuse me, on August 7th, 2020 at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, this RFA will fund South Florida projects for the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, uh, the South Florida Coral Reef Initiative, Caloosahatchee Estuary, Indian River Lagoon, Florida Bay, and Biscayne Bay. So again, thank you to the NEP staff for previously disseminating this information for us to our IRL partners. And I understand that there's already some um, proposals kind of in the works for the South Florida Geographic Initiative. So I'm excited um, that we're gonna have some representation for Indian River Lagoon. And um, with that, I'll go ahead and hand it to Vince so he can talk about another grant opportunity. And then if there's any questions, we can, what, we can take that. So Vince. Awesome. 
great. Uh, thanks for having me. And greetings from a uh, rainy and cloudy Washington, D.C. Uh, just a quick update uh, from headquarters is that uh, the NEP has actually reached a, a milestone with our um, NEP competitive grant, officially called the NEP Coastal Watersheds Grant. Uh, with the deadline for the letters of intent uh, next Friday. Oh, sorry. As you all may have heard, uh, Ray, uh, Restore America's Estuaries, uh, is the one that administering uh, the sub award in uh, cooperation with EPA. And these sub awards are essentially meant to address urgent and challenging environmental issues. And uh, as you all know, the uh, environmental, ecological, and um, in, uh, economic uh, impacts in, along coastal areas. And so for this round of RFP, our RFP uh, the priority areas are going to be targeting towards nutrients, loss of habitat, and uh, coastal erosion, and, sea of, and flooding. And so we're uh, looking forward to seeing what we'll get. And um, when I gather that this is also on the agenda uh, item for today, so looking uh, forward to listening in. And uh, before I, uh, I end my uh, update, I just wanna send you guys some good vibes because I know that the hurricane is kind of looming offshore. So hopefully things will, uh, be like bit they were before and they just gonna skirt off the coast and there's gonna be a little impact to you guys so thank you again for having me thank, thank you Vince. does anybody have any questions for either jennifer or vince at this point no okay as i know we're gonna have some further conversations down the way is anybody from the public wishing to comment on anything in in general <laughs> Nope. Okay. Then we will move on to our water quality reports. Our first water quality report is going to be the Northern and Central Lagoon um, by Dr. Chuck Jacoby. Welcome, Dr. Jacoby. Good to see Thank you. you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Good morning. So just briefly wanted to walk through some of the conditions from um, sort of January up to July here. I think you can kind of summarize the overall picture by saying summer is definitely beginning to take hold. So this first slide um, shows you the salinities um, at five of the, at the five continuous monitoring sons that the district manages. Um, one's up in Mosquito Lagoon, Southern Mosquito Lagoon. Uh, one BRL is in Banana River Lagoon. Um, Coco, um, that's in the Indian River Lagoon. O'Galley further south and Vero further south again. Um, and you can see where the red arrow is here that, um, you know, rainfall began um, sort of, that's late May. And uh, salinities dropped, uh, particular, not except for um, at Coco and O'Galley. And again, that has to do a bit with, sorry, at Coco and Banana River Lagoon. That has to do with the differential freshwater inputs. So where you get you know, reasonable inputs from tributaries or canals, salinities respond where you don't, they stay a little more stable. Um, so Kayleen, are you pushing these next one, maybe? Thanks. Uh, temperatures um, are, you know, climbing um, and have been climbing since sort of January. Um, now running right around 30 degrees Celsius or about 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So the water's pretty warm everywhere. Um, and next, chlorophyll levels um, were high early in the year, um, and that's in um, near Coco and in Banana River Lagoon. Um, most of that chlorophyll was a diatom, Pseudonychia. Um, this is a diatom that, that does produce a toxin at times, um, but we didn't have any reports of that happening. Um, chlorophyll levels, you know, fell for a fairly long period of time, thus the very clear water everybody's been reporting. 
Um, and then recently there have been some increases again, um, particularly in Mosquito Lagoon and the Indian River Lagoon down near Vero. And in those cases, the dominant tends to be different so that it's the pyridinium, which is the dinoflagellate that gives you the bioluminescence and that's been dominant up in the north. And then the pseudonychia, the diatom has been more dominant further south. Um, next. The dissolved oxygen levels have held pretty well, um, except for where that red arrow shows you a dip below two. That was a dip down to about 1.4 milligrams per liter near cocoa. And below two is when there's a lot of stress on the aquatic organisms. And so, in fact, there were some small fish kills reported near the Merritt Island Causeway, O'Galley Causeway. And then later, a little bit later, um, in July, early July, up near Titusville. And that early July one is potentially the fact that um, oxygen levels were low for a, not necessarily below two, but relatively low for a fairly long period of time. Again, this was mostly the pyridinium, which is tends to be found in what I call patchy blooms. So dense patches, but not extensive blooms. Um, we did, however, get reports of nanoplankton, um, which uh, includes the brown tide and in some of these organisms did look like brown tide. Uh, and that was on the 21st of July near the NASA Causeway and then over in Banana River Lagoon in Ke around Kelly Park. So we aren't out of the woods yet, as you might say. Um, but th thus far, and then of course we've had this morning's event which was reported. Um, one of my folks, Lauren Hall, went down and had a look, but um, over large a large distance, um, she couldn't see any major issues. She wasn't able to get you know near the shoreline, um, going through people's backyards as it were, but um, it's, it's, she didn't see a widespread issue at this point in time. And I think that's it. All right, wonderful. Any questions for Dr. Jacoby? No. Okay. Thank you for the update. Our next update is going to be St. Lucie County uh, by Mr. Brandon Friedman. Welcome. Good to see you. Thank you. Glad to be here. All right. Good morning, council members and everyone else here. All right. Uh, the only, uh, the main point of note on this slide is that over the period from November to June, we have gotten quite a bit more rainfall over that period. It was a little bit more than uh, five inches. Uh, next slide, please. Where do I have access to that? All right, thank you. All right. So uh, these are the estimated total nitrogen and phosphorus load calculations for the C23 and C24 basins and 10 Mile Creek. Rain flow data comes from the South Florida Water Management District's the Hydro Database. Hmm? The rainfall data used in the spreadsheet comes from uh, station ID TMCWX, located in 10 Mile Creek, uh, specifically DBKAL744, which is reported in daily average for the time reported. Flow monitoring stations are S48-S for the C23, S49-S for the C24, and Gordian for 10 Mile Creek. The total nitrogen and total phosphorus concentrations are based on the DEP's WASH model. Rainfall for this quarter was three inches above average in the basins and was about 130 tons, while total phosphorus was about 25 tons. These numbers just reiterate how important uh, those IRL south northern components are to help the river lagoon. Yeah, that's it on my part. All right, are there any questions for Brandon on the St. Lucie report? No? All right, then we will move on to the Southern Lagoon uh, by Ms. Diane Hughes with Martin County. And I'd just like to say, Diane, it's really good to see you back. Um, we've missed you and uh, welcome. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I missed everyone as well. Um, this is just my cover slide. So next slide, please. 
and just let me say, I, I did um, prepare this presentation um, over a week ago. So some things have changed. As you see right here, you know, last week, the lake stage was at 12.77. As of this morning, the lake is at 13.21 feet with that kind of storm skirting next to us coming. So we've continued to have, you know, wet weather in our region and the lake continues to slowly rise. Next slide, please. Oh, okay. yes. That's fine, next slide. So um, this is where I have some updates. When you see the negative numbers, uh, that means the water is back flowing into the lake. So from the C44 basin for quite some time now, uh, the Army Corps has been back flowing uh, all of our stormwater runoff from all these rains that we've been having into Lake Okeechobee. I have heard some minor grumblings from some folks that they, would prefer that water to be going into Calkins Water Farm rather than into the lake because they feel that the high nutrients from our 344 basin are increasing the bloom within Lake Okeechobee. And those are just rumblings that I've heard here and there. Um, <clears throat> they are sending some water over to the, the West Coast, but as of uh, today, um, they're not, no longer sending um, water that way. Next slide, please. This is just another version of, of um, I believe, Brandon, Brandon's um, rainfall. So as he stated and Chuck stated, we continue to have a um, pretty good amount of rain within our region. Um, and looks like we're going to, for the foreseeable future, <laughs> during this hurricane season, it's going to be a wet one, it looks like. Next slide, please. And with that rain, and um, you know, we have not had any Lake Okeechobee discharges. So these salinity conditions, which are um, decreasing over time with the continued rains that we've had, um, are all from our local watershed runoff. Nothing from Lake Okeechobee has impacted us at this point in time, and hopefully that won't change with this coming storm, but it may, you just never know. So conditions for oysters are really fair in the mid estuary. They get good closer to the inlet where we have some flushing, um, but not looking too well for them in the, in the middle estuary as they continue to, um, our salinities continue to decrease. Thank you. Yes, you could go to the next slide, thanks. Um, with our stormwater runoff that we have from all these rains, we typically have flare-ups of um, Pico coliform, the Enterococcus levels at different um, parts throughout the estuary. The Roosevelt Bridge is our middle estuary and you can see earlier in July we have some poor levels of the Enterococcus and went to good. It'll probably change next week if I look at the numbers or probably have more red because of the rain that we've been having. Uh, Layton Park is pretty much um, mid estuary too and then Sanskrit Park and Stewart Sandbar are more are closer to the to the inlet so they get a little bit better flushing. But then as you look down on the bottom, it, it, it's reported in a different way because these are the beach sampling. The Stewart Causeway, you can see, um, went from good in mid-July to and July 20th, it went to moderate levels in Terracotta. So that tells me that our stormwater runoff is rushing all through the mid-estuary and getting into the southern, these two sites are the southern Indian River Lagoon are getting into the Southern Indian River Lagoon and, and causing some issues with enterococcus levels there, unfortunately. That's all our own watershed runoff. Next slide. This is a, a slide that uh, comes from the Florida Oceanographic Society um, from their good folks at the Citizens Volunteer Water Quality Monitoring Network. We've had a lot of discussion about the, the grading of the past meetings that we've had this week, the management board and the, um, and the STEM group. Because in a lot of people's mind's eye, a dissolved oxygen of 4.0 at the inlet and 5.0 in the Indian River Lagoon, to most folks would seem very satisfactory and be more like an A rather than a B or a C. 
but it's my understanding from Mark Perry at Florida Oceanographic Society that their ratings are based on state water quality standards. So um, they've developed this system. Um, this is the first time I've, I've used this, this data from them. Um, I, I hope that the um, board was satisfied with um, Mr. Perry's um, answer regarding the, the scale um, earlier this week. Next slide. <clears throat> so this um, imagery and information has also changed this week. So last week, the lake looked like it had approximately 85% coverage of um, bloom potential. This week, it has moved, um, as of the report that I received yesterday, to 40% um, bloom potential. So it went from 85 to 40, which is better for us in case we do get any discharges. And also in their sampling this week, last week, the sampling showed 23 uh, detections of toxins within the lake in their sampling event. This week, they only found 11 detections of toxins in their sampling. So looks like the toxin levels may be going down and, and the bloom potential is also going down. So that's good news. Is there another, or is this my last slide? Oh, that was my last slide. Any questions? Uh, Madam Chair, yes. you, this is Chris in <laughs> County. Um, you said a couple times that this is your own uh, watershed. Well, uh, unfortunately, St. Lucie County is part of that watershed. I just want to again show the uh, validity and the need of the C23, C24 uh, cleansing cells and, and reservoirs that are necessary to uh, eliminate or at least reduce the amount of <clears throat> discharge that we have coming into the North Fork, including the 10 Mile Creek. Uh, we need to be able to start uh, moving some of those projects forward to take some pressure <laughs> off of our friends in Martin County. So I know that uh, the commission uh, there is supportive of our efforts, um, but uh, I just want to continue to raise it when we see these types of numbers come through and there is no lake discharges that it's important to continue to drive that message home because we do need the, the money to do the engineering, the pd &E studies and the land and to begin to build those projects sooner than later. And that's my rant for today. Thank you. We, we do consider you part of our watershed. You're in our BMAP, so we're with you. Okay. <laughs> Ma Madam Thank Chairman? You. Madam yes, Chairman, Doug. Doug, yeah. Um, Long as uh, that subject was brought up, I was going to bring this up later. But quick, uh, quickly, I've uh, I know the Safe Harbor Agreement for Fish and uh, Wildlife is almost signed. I think two of the three major entities have signed the two districts. Uh, Fish and Wildlife, I think, was supposed to sign that today. So that agreement will allow landowners to enter into a a public-private partnership safely uh, and uh, uh, provide more homes for water, for our water in the western parts of our county. So I'm hopeful, I was kind of hopeful that I could announce it at this meeting, but it's still pending, but that will be a, a big step forward. And secondly, I've been on hold for a reconnection tour with Drew Bartlett uh, and Chauncey, their chairman, and Jackie uh, as well, and then with Dwayne and Mike, uh, with Ann Shortell from my district to show how easily it would be to connect South Florida and St. John's and, and move 200,000 acre feet of water into the upper St. John's rather than into the lagoon. It would, I don't know if you guys know what that means, but that a visual of that is six inches on Lake Okeechobee. That's how much water in our own basin we can eliminate from bludgeoning the lagoon. And with an easy reconnection, we can move that into the upper St. John's where we need the water. I toured the upper basin recently and we can hold another foot of water over 200,000 acres of upper St. John's. So it, it was, it's almost a, a perfect match of the water going into the lagoon and the water we need in the upper St. John's Basin to hydrate the upper basin, which needs the water. So 
Anyway, as soon as COVID allows us to bring the districts and the Lagoon Council together to show them how easy this would be, uh, I plan to do that. Thank you, Doug. We look forward to uh, hearing more about that as you move through that process. Sounds very interesting. All right, if there's no other questions for Diane, thank you, Diane, for the report. Uh, we're going to move on to presentation, but before I turn it over to Dr. DeFries for a presentation on State Road 528, I just want to remind everybody, if you're not speaking, if you could mute, because some of the background noise is making it hard for others to hear, um, and we'll make sure that we get you guys, if you, you know, just raise your hand and we're, between Kayleen and myself, we're monitoring everybody, so I won't miss any comments, I promise. Dr. DeFries, I'm going to turn it over to you for a presentation. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, we've been on the uh, State Road 528 issue for quite some time. And what I'd like to do is just quickly give you an update on the science and the pathway from here to decision points uh, as it relates to this uh, east-west corridor in Brevard County. Next slide. So just as a refresher, uh, for the last number of years, and uh, Bob Musser at Fort Canaveral reminded me last night that he and I have been engaged now uh, almost three years on this discussion. Uh, the plan uh, of FDOT is to six lane from the current four lane, uh, this east-west corridor across Indian River and Banana River as it enters Fort Canaveral and those roadways connect to the southern part of uh, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Next slide. And back about a little over a year ago now, um, the, the council passed a resolution, and I just wanted to remind you because it was very specific in the recommendation to the partners, the TPO and FDOT, as we move forward, that the council encouraged the inclusion of any and all infrastructure improvements to benefit the lagoon, the economy, and coastal resilience of those corridors. And so I have been operating with our technical partners uh, to make sure that, you know, the best available science was available for that decision making. Next slide. And so what I wanna do is to kind of, you know, give you a, a really high level view. You've got three presentations in your backup documents from presentations that were given to the TPO uh, earlier this month. Uh, but I, I'd be remiss not to say thank you to Fort Canaveral, who teamed with us to do some of the modeling work, and especially to Dr. Ann Shortell. I'm gonna show you some model results from the St. Johns River Water Management District. Uh, she put her modeling team on this effort and in a really short amount of time, I think created something that could be transformative as a tool when we look at water quality and nutrient loads. And so where we are right now is that uh, DOT is at about 60% line. Uh, both the NEP, Port Canaveral, and St. John's have been sharing uh, different model information uh, as well as sea level rise information with those TPO partners. And it all came to kind of a head of information at the beginning of this month uh, when this uh, issue was addressed by Space Coast TPO. Next slide. So just a couple of highlights. The first is Dr. Gary Zerillo under a contract with us, but funded in part by Port Canaveral, uh, looked at multiple uh, variations of what expanding that bridge span and reducing the actual dirt causeway would do to flow. So this is just an example, uh, but on the left-hand side, you can see the current situation and the bluer, the, the color, the more flow that you have or flushing, the redder, the longer the, you know, the time for flushing. And we all know that water flows flow matters. And so Zerillo's work, which was extensive, and I want to give him kudos. I mean, his contract was pretty modest. He went above and beyond anything we would have imagined to try to get us answers. 
and including well beyond the scope of work. But on the right hand side, you can see a visual representation that if you expanded 528 alone, basically you don't see uh, any improvement, as you might expect. This is a, you know, micro tidal, you know, area of the lagoon with uh, long residence times. But if you open 528 and 520 to the south, uh, you could see between 9.3 and 17 percent flushing improvement. While you kind of look at it and say, yeah, 9.3 percent, that's not much. When you think about a microtidal lagoon, uh, those are not insignificant water flow improvements. But as we were discussing this with our technical partners um, and also uh, with the transportation partners, you know, the question came up, well, what does that mean as it relates to water quality? And I'm going to showcase that in a minute. Next slide. The other thing Dr. Zarillo provided uh, was a local perspective of sea level rise. So if you look at the graph on the right, and I'm going to simplify this to a very kind of big picture view. If you look at global sea level rise on average, you know, different places around the world, including different places on the eastern seaboard in North, you know, North America, are going to have different impacts locally depending on land subsidence and local features of hydrology. And if you look at the graph above, and you know, everybody on the council have been in Florida for a while, you can see some of that variability when we look at the actual numbers uh, over time. And what that, those peaks of highs and lows show on that graph are the seasonal high stands. As you know, we'll get through this beginning part of the hurricane season. And of course, that's a storm surge risk. But as we move into October, late September, October, November, we'll see seasonal high stand based on where the Gulf Stream comes into you know, our coastal areas. And so the message that Dr. Zarillo provided to TPO and FDOT was this, and it's simple. You can't just look at linear global sea level and say that you've effectively and appropriately analyzed risk. And he said, you really need to combine that average sea level to those local parameters, both storm surge as well as those seasonal stands and together that will give you a better perspective of your vulnerability over not just a decade, but the next, you know, five decades, because this roadway that they're getting ready to move forward to expand will be here 50 to 70 years. Next slide. So the district, in, in this discussion about what does it mean for water quality, uh, Dr. Ann Shortell uh, basically uh, put her team at the Water Management District on a very challenging course. She asked the modelers to take their hydrology model and see if they couldn't tweak it. And I, and I say tweak because that's all I understand about how they do the math on this. It's really complicated what they just did, but they began to input nutrient data and chlorophyll A data uh, and then look to see if there was alignments between historic reference points to see how well this model, um, let's just call it this model advancement or improvement might predict chlorophyll A, which is a proxy for algal blooms. And so when we, when the district ran that model just on the causeway improvements with low elevation bridges, and looked back, you know, they call it a hindcast, hindcasted back to June 11th during the, you know, the tail end of that super bloom. It basically showed that there was no prediction of water quality improvement with just elevating the causeways. And actually, as a scientist and somebody who's been involved for a while, I looked at that and went, you know, that makes a lot of common sense because it, it's a slow flow system by nature. 
it's a long residence time because it's in a, a lagoon. So you don't get enough improvement to fundamentally change the vulnerability of that low flow to the nutrient loads that are coming from all those land-based sources. But what the district team did, and kudos to them, you know, they thought, well, why don't we look at it at the next step against the BMAP and the total maximum daily loads? Go ahead and show the next slide. And so when they actually looked at nutrient reduction as a driver for restoration of water quality in this now somewhat predictive model, uh, you can see how much the predicted uh, water quality and vulnerability to chlorophyll A would be if we met the TMDL conditions in the basin management action plans. So what it does is it gives us a tool, and I've said this to TPO, this doesn't make a decision for you, but it's a tool to advise decision making. So next slide. So where this discussion is now is that uh, FDOT has been holding off on any further movement on their end to get this information uh, provided and, and, and then distributed to the TPO partners. Uh, TP, uh, FDOT is at 60% PD&E. Uh, their position is should any major design changes like low elevation bridges be considered and requested, there'll be lost time and money. And some concerns that that may delay uh, State Road 401, which is an important improvement that's planned for the future for Port Canaveral. And of course, funding we all know is somewhat uncertain. Uh, if the project moves forward with current design, then the option to improve flow through causeways virtually is lost. If you don't do 528, you know, we're probably not going to see any appreciable value of looking down the line at 520. Um, and so the burden of both opportunity and also responsibility, should they move forward as design, uh, will shift over to the regulatory agencies during the permitting process. Uh, FDOT has uh, proposed uh, that they would shift to nutrient reduction strategies in your full report, the backup, you can see some of the kind of the predicted nutrient loads. But if they shifted from traditional stormwater to septic to sewer as a mitigation strategy, uh, there was significant improvement in nutrient reduction. Next slide. But at the meeting, uh, which uh, happened early this month, uh, we gave those three presentations that you have in your package to both the Technical Advisory Committee the Citizen Advisory Committee, and later in the week to the Governing Board. Both advisory committees recommended uh, that TPO move forward with DOT as designed. In the Governing Board meeting, some very important and also very poignant questions were asked uh, that I think left the Governing Board, you know, in a challenging position. And one of those was made by uh, Commissioner Brian Lober about how does what you, you propose as nutrient reduction in a mitigation strategy compare to that nine to seventeen percent flow? You know, can you standardize that on on load reduction? And so where we are right now is uh, governing board tabled any decision at that set, that meeting. Uh, they will uh, readdress this on September tenth. Uh, both the district, um, our contract with F, you know, FIT are now completed. And I ended uh, that meeting with the governing board, just letting them know that, you know, this is an important decision. Uh, it's one that has, you know, long-term impacts for years and that we stand by our resolution and we're here to assist in any way possible as they move forward. So with that, I'll just turn it over to the chair and answer any questions. Are there any questions for Dr. DeFries on, or comments on this issue or presentation? Let's see. Jackie, did you have a comment? Are you trying to unmute yourself? 
see. Hold on. There you go. Okay. Did you have a All comment? Right. I, uh, I just wanted to ask uh, Dr. DeFries how difficult it would be to uh, stand firm against the recommendation of uh, the FDOT moving forward as uh, expected. I think that um, any opportunity to uh, unclog these causeways uh, is a tremendous opportunity and should be encouraged for everyone. And if anyone has money, it's FDOT. And usually every agency just has a tendency to try to to stay, you know, to stay doing what they're doing. No one likes to change. No one likes to look, think of the future. Um, but I think this is an important uh, opportunity. So Dr. DeFries, is, is it worth fighting for? Personally, I think uh, any improvement to the lagoon that's gonna either um, accelerate our restoration or maybe decrease the amount of work we have to do to see restoration is worth the, worth the effort. It's hard to compare where DOT was because to be honest, whatever they mitigate in septic to sewer is not going to deliver full TMDL compliance under a BMAP. And so, you know, it still will be incremental. So should it be uh, council's will uh, to send a strong message back to PPO um, and to FDOT um, at your direction, I'm happy to, you know, craft that letter, present it to Space Coast TPO, uh, whatever you would all want and put it on the record uh, if you are all in consensus to do so. Uh, our resolution, as you saw, was about consideration. Uh, you took no stand on what direction it would go other than you were very clear that you wanted consideration for, and I quote, any and all improvements. And so if you want to clarify that in a letter um, and direct me to submit that for the written record, I'm happy to do so. Okay. I think that, um, as I recall, we had um, really robust discussions on that resolution when it came up um, and how we were going to craft that language because we always walk that fine line. But I, it, it did say consider any and all improvements. And I think, you know, right now in Florida's history, the governor and the state are making water quality a major platform for their administrations. And every DOT transportation project, not just in this area, but, you know, we have some in Indian River County that might not be on the lagoon, but they, there are stormwater implications for those projects that they really need to be considering the water quality impacts and new and effective approaches to that mitigation. Um, otherwise, we're just going to end up with the status quo. Um, so I can understand some of the frustrations that this project is causing and I would tend to agree that if this project, if something different isn't done with this project particularly, then it's just going, it's kind of like the linchpin project. So, you know, I'm, I'm with the consensus of, of the group, whatever everybody might want to do, but I did just kind of want to throw that out because as I recall, um, we've had a couple of conversations on this and uh, understanding that this might be a bigger issue than it looks like. Chris, you had a comment. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think that uh, we as the NEP, as the council for the entire lagoon, have an obligation to participate in the discussion on this. Uh, we have a number of agencies that sit here together and we all try to find the best possible outcomes for the entire lagoon, uh, oftentimes voting for other, uh, other areas of the lagoon uh, to forego some of our own opportunities. Uh, it's about doing what's in the best interest of the entire lagoon. Um, the fact that we can put together governmental agencies and secure support gives us that leverage, I think, to be able to move that forward with a resolution or a letter uh, from Dr. DeFries from us, uh, because our entire mission is about the lagoon. And this is a huge opportunity. This is 50 years in the making. Um, 
meaning that it'll be the bridge uh, will be 50 years in in, in place. Yes. Uh, so if we don't make that 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 change today on how we think and how we operate, then we're only going to continue to do the same things we've always done uh, and and not get the benefits. So I'm absolutely positively in support of moving this forward and and trying to gain consensus uh, here and then also uh, support from the Florida Department of Transportation. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else with other comments or questions, concerns, input? No. Madam Chair, um, I'd very much like to hear from uh, Commissioner Kurt Smith since this is kind of within his you know, backyard and, and Brevard Most County. Most definitely. A major player in this. Uh, and then, then I'd like to follow up with a little detail so I, I clearly understand okay. how you're directing me. Of course. Commissioner Smith, do you have some um, background you can give us on this or, or your thoughts on the issue? Yes. Can you hear me? Of course. Yes, sir. Okay. Because I was hitting my little chat button and, and evidently you weren't hit, seeing it or it wasn't. Oh, working. I'm so sorry. Um, that's okay. I'm sure I wasn't doing it right. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm all ears. I sit on the TPO and of course I sit on this board. So I would love to have some support as, as Chris mentioned, some type of letter or something along that line from this board that I could carry to the TPO meeting on September 10th. And of course, I will be uh, voicing my own concerns, which are, and I think Commissioner Lober uh, from Brevard County made a great point that if nine to 17% doesn't sound like a whole lot, <clears throat> but when you consider it's year after year after year of over 50 to 75 years, it's huge. So I think as Dr. DeFries has mentioned, if we don't do it, we forever hold our peace because we're not gonna get a second shot at this apple. I agree. I agree. And, and your comments hold great weight. Um, Chris, did you have a, a follow-up to that? Yeah, simply, um, you know, I think, the, I think the science that was presented briefly here today is very important for those who will be at the TPO and, and have thought to understand uh, in, in, a, in a different realm. Engineers and, and, and construction folks have a different way of thinking. Scientists go after the answers and, and, and they, they fight the answers back and forth until they get a, a, a real decision with real science. And I think being able to display and to be able to share that, that position with those who are engineers who don't think like scientists uh, per se will be very helpful in persuading uh, the argument. Agreed, definitely agreed. Uh, Stacy, did you have a comment? Are you yeah. I can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. I, I can't figure out how to raise my hand on there, but um, I would certainly support, you know, and look forward to hearing from Dr. DeFries how he might structure the letter that I would, but I would support us sending a letter um, to the TPO on behalf of the council. Fantastic. Dr. DeFries, what, um, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I want to, Number one, remind everybody that we have had a long-standing policy about not getting engaged in specific permit and regulatory issues, uh, but have you know broad capabilities and authorities uh, to weigh in on large kind of policy issues. And this is a large policy issue. That's number one. Number two, I, I also want to share with you that um, one of the things that FDOT has suggested uh, to Space Coast TPO, that should they move forward with nutrient reduction using septic to sewer, that they would advance those dollars to Brevard County in advance of construction. Of course, this is all, you know, on that, that verbal record in order to get the improvements quicker. And, and I have to give them credit that they, they have been hearing us. And in fact, one of the really great things about this two-year process is that now I've had a few invitations to sit in on some DOT early conversations about future projects and that culture change needed to happen. So this is what I'm gonna recommend and if the council is comfortable with it, 
that we structure this letter, you know, on three bullets and I can share it with you individually and get your comments back before we submit. Number one, you know, kind of stand by our resolution, you know, to seek, seek every and all improvements and kind of make the case that, you know, a low rise elevation bridge, you know, is an option that should not be, you know, ignored just because the time money argument, that there is more to consider here than just that time and money. Number two, that, and this came up at our meeting, and we talked about it there. To my knowledge, there hasn't been a whole lot of consideration about a intermediate strategy. So one of the arguments has been, gosh, if you go back to an elevated bridge, you know, we don't know how much it's gonna cost. It's gonna be really expensive. We heard multiple estimates that are not hard numbers. Uh, but the, the other side of it is we never heard anybody talk about relief bridges you know, in order to get those corners moving water, you know, you won't get nine to 17% flow because we had Zerillo take a look at that a little bit, uh, but you would get some improvement. And one of the challenges I think for TPO is this worry that if they trigger a new design, that they're gonna have to go all the way back to the federal side and start this all over again. And then, and then lastly, I think it, a statement. So statement number one would be, you know, the elevated bridge, the value of nine to 17% flow. The second bullet would be, you know, considering other options, you know, that may not cause such a delay if that's actually the case in the process. And number three is if should TPO vote to move forward that, we recommend that the regulatory oversight agencies, which really will fall with St. John's River Water Management District, make sure that we are seeing optimal, if not maximal mitigation, you know, as it relates to that potential nine to 17% flow. And so basically it would shift the burden of decision-making into that regulatory mitigation world. So um, I'm throwing that out as kind of a three-pointer and I can craft a draft letter, send it to you individually to get individual comments, you know, and, and see it, you know, here if there's kind of a consensus and we'll just weigh in along with a reminder of our uh, resolution. That's all I have. Okay. Okay. Jackie, did you have a comment? I think you were trying to... Could I... Um... I know that this is a scientific entity, but I think it's also important in the communication to note that this is setting the tone for the next century. Um, you know, this is all connected to uh, Brightline and the airport and uh, Cape Canaveral. And uh, this is an opportunity to set the tone in, for the future and not to be doing the same old thing. You don't have to say it like that. But I, I think it's important to, um, to point out uh, how important this is, what an incredible opportunity this is. And maybe that's not dollars and cents, and maybe that's not a, some kind of test, but um, it's the truth. <laughs> and um, the other thing, I, um, Dr. DeFries, can you explain kind of what you were getting at with number three? I didn't understand that. And you know, I do think noting the, um, you know, septic to sewer is extremely important and that's absolutely something everyone should be supporting and it is supported by the legislature and the governor and the district, South Florida Water Management District. Um, however, you know, we all have our roles and I kind of see like, you know, when FDOT starts basically mitigating because it doesn't want to make the bridge higher, um, you know, that's, I'm sorry, that's their responsibility. There's, there have been issues and science coming out for a long time about causeways blocking and uh, the difference of, of high bridges. You know, I don't, uh, they need to do the right thing. End of story. But could you please uh, clarify what number three was? I think it had to do with septic tanks and mitigation. 
Uh, basically, number three would be a statement from us that should TPO and their partners decide to move forward as designed, that, and I think the language would be the both burden and opportunity to do the right thing for the lagoon, then falls on the regulatory mitigation decision. That uh, you know, the decision shouldn't be, and I, I've said this on the record at other meetings, and, and Commissioner, I actually, because I didn't have your, the discussion we're having now, but uh, Commissioner Lober kind of put me on, on point um, and asked me my personal opinion. So I took off my representation of council and NEP, and I described their opportunity to do the right thing in this term. You know, incrementally, you're adding two lanes to a four lane highway. You know, that happens all the time. But if they wanted to make a legacy decision with a vision for one of the most important east-west corridors to the state of Florida because of Port Canaveral and also because of what's going on at Kennedy Space Center uh, with commercial launch, yes. this is the one and only opportunity they will have to reimagine that corridor for the 21st century not for today, but for 50 years from now, when, when people look back and, and say, wow, you know, they were really thinking kind of in, in a visionary way about what Florida might look like in a half a century. Dwayne, that is so cool. And I had not put that symbolism together that it's to Cape Canaveral. I mean, of all places, absolutely, uh, that should be a visionary construction. Thank you. If you want to see that not so articulate presentation, it is on the FDOT website. To be honest, the commissioner caught me a little off guard, and I rarely go off, you know, off script representing you all. Uh, when he asked me, and the question was, you know, you've been here 40 years. What would you do if you were you were us? And so I did not want to represent you all without your expressed authority to do so. So I took my hat off and basically gave that very message on the record at that meeting. Uh, but as it relates to mitigation, um, let me do it like practically. So if they did more than the minimum, if they could actually demonstrate that the mitigation that they're proposing with nutrient reduction would actually make a difference in water quality in a quicker time frame. Then the decision becomes one of you know timing and value. So we won't get that nine to seventeen percent flow improvement, you know, with just five twenty eight. Five twenty eight ten years away from construction. We're going to have to wait for 520 to be constructed, which could be 15 or more years away. So if they could actually quantify to some reasonable standard that their mitigation strategy would have a significant improvement to water quality, and they targeted to that rather than the minimum mitigation and at the least amount of cost to DOT, then I think there's the ability for FDOT and Space Ghost TPO to actually make a science-based case that, you know, the sooner we get improvement to the lagoon, the better. You know, we're going to get a quicker benefit with a mitigation strategy that's appropriately targeted versus waiting for the, the construction. Now, for me personally, and I'll share my personal thought on that, I'd like to see both. That, you know, I, I honestly think that uh, when we look at sea level rise projections in our Barrier Islands, that uh, we are not going to be the same Florida we are today in 50 to 100 years. And, and we really do need to reimagine transportation corridors, not on just what we have today, but what our population and our demographics, you know, where that population will reside in the future. And, uh, you know, I've got a sense of what you all want, should you all agree that that's how you want to 
move forward. And then what I'll do is I'll draft this letter, send it to you individually to get your individual comments to make sure that you know it's encompassing this discussion. Wonderful. It sounds like um, you have a grasp on what everybody's uh, implicating, and it looks like we have a general consensus from the board to go ahead and do that. So unless there's any other comments or questions on this, we will go ahead and move into our management conference, conference <laughs> committee. Madam report. Chair? Yes. On this one, one be because of the sensitivities in politics, I would really appreciate, you know, a motion on this a one. Motion? Okay. And so, you know, if you have any abstentions or dissent, that I have a sense of that as well. If that's okay. Sure. That is fine. Um, is somebody want to make a motion to move forward with a letter? This is as Jackie Mr. Thurlow Lippish, I'd like to make a motion to move forward with a letter. Okay, and I'll be happy to second that. And we'll go ahead and do a roll call vote. Uh, so, Doug, that's a yes. Okay. Chris? Yes. Stacy? Yes. Jackie? Yes. Kurt? Yes. Jason? Yes. Billy? Yes. And yes for myself. All right, so that should give us clear direction. Thank you, everybody, for that. That was a good discussion. With Thank that, you. we will move on to our management board report. Mr. Yulovich. The floor is yours. All right, well, hold on, we'll unmute you. There you go. Now the floor okay. is yours. Boy, Take my wife would like my wife would like that button, by the way. <laughs> I'm gonna go off script for a for a second, and I'm sure this is followed by a bunch of groans, but let me let me just go piggyback on what Doug said about the reconnection. Uh, perhaps a lot of people aren't familiar with the details and maybe at some point in time uh, we should have a, a deeper discussion when, we, when we're more normal and normalized type meeting. The, the roots of the reconnection are founded in the 1954 Flood Control uh, Act and um, when the legislation hydraulically separated the two districts and created the two districts from the Central and South Florida Flood Control District the 1970s, it wasn't too long after that, that we did one of those long pauses and said, hmm, we need to think about reconnecting. And that lied pretty well dormant till the mid 90s where there was an onslaught of discharges uh, into the lagoon and prompted a lot of uh, citizen action and committees and all that. So probably from the mid 90s, Doug and I and others, uh, a lot of the uh, dual district folks and, and special interest groups uh, have been working on that for the past 25 years, and um, it's been 25 years. And, and I think it's relevant to, to some of the newer people in town and, and some of the older people in town to understand the importance of that. And one of the byproducts of, our recur of the reconnection thought were water farms as a temporary or permanent uh, assist to that. So I just wanted to piggyback onto that and let me move into my agenda item. This past Tuesday we had our management board and uh, I'd like to say it was a very successful meeting because it met two criteria. It started on time and it ended on time. It was well attended by, by a great group of folks as you all know. We had new member participation from Matt, Matt Mitz who's the Public Works Director in Vero which is a key addition. We know the significance of the city of Vero Beach within, within our Lagoon family. We also had the introduction of uh, Yesenia es Escribana from FDOCS. She's replaced Vanessa Bessi. Uh, several of the members on the management board have worked with uh, Yesenia, and I believe I had worked with her previously when she was a DEP, I believe, on BMAP issues back in the old days. Finance Committee, uh, Stu Glass, uh, I cannot say enough about the outstanding job that Stu does running that committee. Uh, you can rest assured that when you make these consent agenda approvals, 
for the finance that, that Stu and his team have gone over. Uh, that group knows the criticality of, of the public fiduciary responsibility and public funds. And we encourage active participation. So if there's a management board member that, that has an interest in participating, that's an open shop uh, for people to participate. We do periodically, as we should have discussions about continuation of contracts that are ongoing. And, and, and we understand good business sense tells us that we don't want to be complacent in that business. But also, uh, I also employ what I call the good mechanics theory. That if you find a mechanic that really takes care of your, your, your needs, you either marry them or uh, you keep them. And particularly if you have a boat, Doug, you don't get rid of a mechanic. So it, it's a balancing act that you have to have for uh, the understanding of your fiduciary responsibilities. But also, as Jack Malloy said many times, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Much discussion, as Diane alluded to, and we were. Uh, extremely happy to have Diane back was uh, the, the um, pivotal roles, the potential roles of the water farm. I understand that that may be handicapped somewhat by uh, the federal permit for its use, but that can be looked at. Also the use of the current in place STA as a repository for water and also as a place for attenuation of water prior to any discharge into the lagoon. We did have a lot of discussion, as Diane alluded to, about the validity of data and the mathematical uh, relationship of that data. And, and um, I, I won't belabor that fact. The, we did the three minute presentations, what I call the quick dating, and, and those were superb. Uh, there's a habitat restoration draft forthcoming by Tetradec um, that we look forward to getting. Under your, under your council agenda, item number 11A, uh, the board agreed and approved the, the consistent with the categories of up to uh, the total of a uh, million dollars in those categories. Uh, we felt uh, that it was extremely important to let applicants know that there may only be $500,000 in a category. And if you have a $5 million project that you may want to look at modifying that. Under 11B, the COVID funding, I can't tell you how much uh, I, I personally and the board appreciates all that Kathy did to assemble what I call the Fab Five. She has found five outstanding individuals that not only was the action beneficial to those individuals, but will be significantly beneficial to the lagoon in the community that we, we serve. And under 11C, uh, in, in Daniel's, uh, Daniel did these nice, what I call one page snapshots of, of everything you need to know about a particular project that's, that's been done and where it's at. And, and kudos to Daniel for that. I, I do want to take a moment, not, not at the discredit of the other projects, but because I'm very familiar with the West Babasso area and the economic challenges and, and the historic significance of that area to a special shout out to Indian River County, Vince Burke and, and the team that, that worked on that. We did talk uh, uh, much about, as you did, the State Road 528. That's been, that's been going on for several years. Uh, we we're very supportive of sticking our head in the tent and trying to get the rest of the body in there. And, and Dwayne has, has breached that with Kurt Smith's role. Um, I'm very sure that we're gonna have outstanding representation and a voice in that. You know, the issue does come up as, as to mitigation and the value of that mitigation and, and being familiar with mitigation banking, there has to be an established value associated with and agreed upon value associated with whatever is being mitigated. So it's not a, a, an open number. It has to be something that everybody feels is valued in, in the time frame that, that uh, Dwayne refers to. Uh, in agenda item number 12A, uh, we discussed that and gleaned uh, and supported uh, uh, Dwayne's recommendation for two letters of intent. Uh, very, management board very supportive of that uh, concept of the compilation of data. We're also in regards to the endorsement of the calendar. We're very happy with the sequencing of the management board preceded by the finance committee and followed by the STEM committees on Tuesday. Hopefully we'll be able to get back to that beautiful location and up the creek. 
And finally, uh, you know, knowing Carolyn before her district life at the, at the Water Management District and before her representing here, and now she's going back, who would have thunk it? Uh, we're going to miss her. And, and then it just gives us an opportunity to break in another attorney. So that's the management re board report from this past Tuesday. Uh, I will answer any questions, and I'm proud to serve. Thank you, Bob. Um, anybody have any questions on the management board report? Jackie, do you have a question? No? Okay. Anybody else? Seeing none, thank you, Bob. We'll move on to the STEM Advisory Committee. Dr. Jacoby. Thank you. Um, we likewise received updates on the various activities that are underway, monitoring plan, restoration plan, state of the lagoon, boater's guide, climate ready estuary, and the new financing strategy, um, all of which, you know, members will take a look at as they roll in. And a lot of the members are active in a lot of those plans. Um, we recommended, uh, again, retaining the distribution of funds for the upcoming uh, request for proposals. Uh, we were impressed by the COVID bridge funding projects. Um, and again, people will participate, contribute. Um, Daniel's update on the projects was, was excellent. And even if we squeezed him a little on time. Um, the 528 situation, yeah, was a debate there. And again, um, it's, a, it's a challenging issue, um, given that we're attempting to move into a realm where we haven't really been before. So thinking about the ecological lift from various projects um, is something that's somewhat new, something we hope to build on as we go forward. And that sort of takes us into the next one, um, which is the, the funds that are out there, the funds that are administered by the Restore America's Estuaries Group. And um, part of that, one of those letters, one of those letters of intent will be to work on the model that you saw some output from um, and try and, and make that into a really usable tool for evaluating projects. Um, we approved the schedule for the meetings in 2021. And uh, we likewise had expressions of gratitude to Carolyn for her assistance with everything. So thank you. In addition, we had a series of presentations on phytoplankton, um, one by um, Ed Flips from the University of Florida for the northern and central parts of the lagoon, sort of an update on conditions as it were, one from Malcolm McFarland, who's at Harbor Branch on the southern part, and those are um, sampling programs that are funded by you folks. Um, Tom Fraser came and or was a part of the meeting and gave us a bit of a insight into the um, Blue Green Algae Task Force and how that and their initial recommendations sort of got translated into the Clean Waterways Act and you know what steps are underway to implement that. Um, and I gave a summary of the work of the Harmful Algal Bloom slash Red Tide Task Force that Duane is also a member of. Um, we also discussed reviving the concept of the Science 2030 document which essentially tries to say, you know, what are the, some of the more pressing questions that science can address to help with the management of the Indian River Lagoon. And that's my report. Wonderful. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Jacoby? No, seeing none, then we will move on to our Citizens Advisory Committee. Um, and Ms. Kathy Hill is going to give that report. Welcome, Kathy. Good morning. So yes, CAC met yesterday, um, and the main thing they had on their agenda was to revisit the um, application criteria for small grants program. Um, there were several outcomes from that. We had a really robust discussion. It lasted probably an hour and a half going through all of the eligibility that were outlined in this past year and sort of discussing where they wanted to take that in the future. Uh, the two main outcomes from that are that they would like to limit the number of proposals an organization can put in. Um, there, were, there were several abusers throwing a lot of spaghetti at the wall, small grants, um, 
during the last cycle. And uh, so they want to sort of limit that and have organizations do kind of an internal competition first and choose their best proposal to put forward to small grants. And then the other thing they decided was that should universities apply, they're going to continue to allow universities to apply for that small pot of money. However, they don't want um, indirect costs to be part of the grant program for that. So they, are, they would like to limit the indirect costs that can be uh, charged by universities for that. So those were the two things from there. And then the other thing they talked about, we shared with them the social media strategy that we have been working with ideas for over the last six to eight months. Um, we have a social media policy and manual at this point that we will share with you at the next meeting, I believe, once it's finalized. Uh, so we wanted to get their input on that. And basically, uh, Ideas is going to be working with Kayleen to manage our social media. Um, mostly that is along three channels. So Facebook, which has somewhat of an older demographic. It's, um, you know, folks with families, older folks. Uh, it's, it's not the young, hip thing that everybody thinks it is anymore. It's much more of an older demographic. So that's going to be our main channel for information. So when events come up or information has to be dispersed to the community, we'll be using Facebook as the main channel for that. Um, Instagram is going to be the channel for sort of inspiration about the lagoon. Um, we are going to move our daily photos over to Instagram so they won't be shared on all three channels anymore. So if you're following and you like the daily photos, you need to do that on Instagram from now on, starting August 1st. Uh, and then instead of just providing the photographer name and where the picture was taken, uh, there'll be sort of a, you know, a great quote that goes along with the picture or some little bit of information about whatever the subject is. So it's just so, it, you know, to engage the public more about the lagoon than just showing them a great picture every morning. And then uh, our Twitter account, they're doing something really novel with this, and y'all can feedback and tell us if you like it. Um, they've convinced us that this is going to be a fun thing. Twitter has a very young demographic. So it's, uh, you know, millennials and Generation Z are the ones using Twitter. And they want to have sort of a, that, that's going to be our fun channel. Um, so they have decided, and we agreed uh, to let them run with this for a while, that the lagoon is going to be the voice on Twitter. So the lagoon will be the one making the tweets. And they have constructed, you know, as a bunch of ex-Disney folks, they have constructed a personality for, for the lagoon. And uh, sort of, it's sort of a female personality, but not always. Um, but the lagoon will be tweeting from here on out. Um, so that'll start uh, beginning August 1st. So follow us on Twitter and uh, tell us how you like it and, and feel free to engage. You know, if, if adjustments have to be made down the road, um, we are certainly willing to do that. One more thing about Twitter, um, the Twitter account is gonna be focused on lagoon friendly behaviors. So that'll be the tips for taking care of the lagoon and taking care of your house and not using fertilizer you know, picking up your pet ways, those kinds of tips and uh, advice for, for being and living lagoon friendly. Uh, and that is pretty much it. Yeah, I think uh, right. that's, the, that's the gist of what they did. Okay, are there any questions for Kathy? Let's see, I'm not seeing any. All right, Kathy, well, we'll look forward to um, tweets from the lagoon starting tomorrow. Yes, let us know how you like those. Yeah, I have to go in and follow it. Um, okay, so we are going to move on to the consent agenda. Uh, there's two items on the consent agenda. We have the approval of the May 8th Board of Directors meetings, and we also have um, a contract amendment with Florida Oceanographic Society, which is a uh, routine scope of work change caused by COVID-19 impacts. There's no fiscal impact to this, and the change just adjusts the cost share ratio. So with that, um, if there's, is there any public comment on the consent agenda? Seeing none, then we will need a motion 
to approve the consent. Madam Chair, this is Stacy Hetherington. I will move uh, approval of the consent agenda. Thank you. Zodowski. And I'll go. Thank you, Commissioner Zadowski. And with that, we'll have a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Bornick? Yes. Mr. Z Commissioner Zadowski? Uh, yes, ma'am. Commissioner Hetherington? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Thurlow Lipich? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Mr. Andriata? Yes. Commissioner Wheeler? Uh, yes, but I was trying to raise my hand. I had. Oh, I'm so sorry. I apologize. That's all right. It's hard to see everybody during all of this. I wanted to make one change on there that the uh, Volusia County for our alternate will not be Dr. Lowry. It will be Deb Denny's. Deb Denny's. Yes. Okay. Okay. And then, yes, I'll approve that. <laughs> Is that minor change okay with everybody that's already voiced approval? I'm going to assume so. Okay. Yes, the motion maker agrees. Okay, okay. thank you, Commissioner Heddington. And I'll go ahead and approve that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and with that, we'll move on to old business. Our first item under old business is our fiscal year 2022 RFPs, Dr. DeFries. Uh, before I address this agenda item, I'm, I'm relieved that uh, as an old guy, the lagoon will be tweeting and not me. <laughs> this item, I can understand that. <laughs> uh, this item is just a uh, addition. Uh, last meeting, you all uh, gave us authority to complete the RFPs, issue them this fall. We're ready to do so, but the one thing we held back at the last meeting was those targeted amounts. And so I'll show you that in the next slide. Uh, we have incorporated and, and will continue all of the corrections, comments, suggestions on process. And then Kayleen, you wanna move me forward? So the requested action is just to uh, authorize the dollar amounts as targets for each of the four RFPs to be issued uh, for the fiscal year 2022 cycle. 500,000 for water quality, 200,000 for habitat restoration, up to 200,000 for community-based restoration, and up to 100,000 for science and technology. And remember that this is all pursuant to availability of funds, you know, as we move forward. Uh, our goal is to try to get those RFPs on the street, uh, probably in the October, early November timeframe to give our partners adequate time to respond with high quality proposals. So that's all I have, Madam Chair. Hold on, let me unmute myself. Is there any questions for Dr. DeFries on that item? All right, any public comment? Nope, then seeing none, um, we will need we will need to approve that. So we will need a motion. Oh, everybody's muted. Doug, move. are you trying to make a motion to approve? Zadowski, move approval. Second. Second by Stacy. Tell Doug, were you trying to say something? I don't want to miss a comment. No. Kayleen, can you unmute Doug? No, I'm, there you go, I'm, Doug. I'm good. I, I support the motion. Okay, I'm sorry. I was trying to keep track of everybody, make sure we're not missing anything. All right, so there is a motion by Commissioner Zadowski with a second by Commissioner Hetherington. For approval. So with that, um, and there's no further public comment. Kathy, did you have a comment? I, I just seen uh, Commissioner Wheeler's hand up. Nope, you're good, Commissioner Wheeler. All right, thumbs up from you, I see. With that, we'll have a roll call. Uh, Doug? Yes. Chris? Oh, where'd I go? There you are. 
Yes. <laughs> yes, got it. Okay. <laughs> Stacy. Yes. Jackie. Yes. Kurt. Yes. Jason. Yes. Billy. Yes. Yes. And I will be a yes as well. And just again, thank you guys for bearing with um, me trying to do this virtually. Um, with that, we will move on to the item 11B, which is COVID bridge funding grants update. Kathy, the floor is yours. Thanks. So uh, as, as Bob mentioned, um, we, we have been presenting this all week to, to our boards and uh, these are the applicants for the COVID bridge funding. Uh, you'll recall we um, put out 10 of these initially for these internships just to, to provide a little bit of cushion for these folks. Um, three of, we got five applicants all together. Three of them are recent college grads, as you can see on the slides. Um, two of them were folks who lost income uh, due to COVID and were working on sort of lagoon issues. Um, so our first one is Laura Isaac Norton. She came to us from University of, uh, oh, sorry, FAU. Um, and she has been data mining all of our projects since inception of the council for uh, nutrient information. So she is looking for reductions in uh, total phosphorus, total nitrogen, and total suspended solids. And we've been working with EPA headquarters for a while on this. Um, trying to better quantify uh, what, uh, what impact our projects have in terms of nutrient reduction. So she is going to um, put together a database on that and we'll be able to share that with EPA and with whoever else wants it. And it will also give us just a better idea of, you know, the impacts that, of what we, what, you know, the impact of what we do, what that is. Uh, Claire Crenshaw came, came to us from University of Alabama. Um, she is working on metrics about the management conference. So we were interested in doing some infographics about the 100 plus people on our management conference and sort of what the reach of those organizations are. Um, and, you know, just kind of determining the impact of having 100 folks in this, this structure we call the management. So she's, she's doing that uh, database for us. And then we have Naha Murphy. She came from University of Miami. Uh, and Naha's a bit of an overachiever. She, uh, she took on, we had initially um, uh, put out the cultural and ecotourism uh, RFPs for these interns on a per county basis. And when we brought her on, she decided she wanted to do the entire lagoon. So out of the 10 of them that we put out, uh, we have seven of them covered it, because Naha took on so much. So she is working on a database for the entire lagoon of nature, heritage, and cultural tourism sites. Uh, Maria Lombardo came to us from Florida Tech and also uh, through a job that she was working on. And she is developing a uh, 30th anniversary fact sheet and uh, anniversary timeline for us. So our anniversary of 30 years uh, begins next year. And so we have her going back uh, and developing a timeline and also going back and asking all of, all of our past directors the things that they think should be on the timeline. So what, what happened on their watch that they're proud of? You know, what were the milestones that they, uh, they encountered and, and handled while they were, they were director of the program? So we're, we're looking forward to seeing that. Um, I think all of the directors have responded so far with the possible exception of one who is still vacationing. Um, Jessie Wales comes to us from Marine Discovery Center, and she has perhaps the most fun project, I think. Um, she is developing a set of 20 myths and mysteries about the lagoon, so she is working on dispelling those funny things that people believe about the lagoon that just aren't true. Um, one of the ones that was a new one on me, uh, she's working on dispelling the myth that if you take mullet slime and rub it in your cuts, that it will cure you. <laughs> so. Um, that, that's one of, you know, the, one of the things that she's working on for us. So it, it's information along that line. So that'll be fun for social media and, and sharing with folks in the future. And the, the other thing she's doing is developing these short narratives on uncommon animals or plants in the lagoon. 
So we're really happy with their progress. Um, every, they're about halfway through their internships already and everybody's made great progress so far. Wonderful. Are there any questions for Cassie on our um, interns? No, I'm looking forward to the end results. Some of those are really, I mean, they're all really cool projects, but, but some of them seem like they're going to be fascinating once they're done for sure. Okay. Um, yes. This is Dwayne. I just want to not just congratulate, but thank the, uh, the board for having made this decision. I just texted uh, Vince Bacalan, who's on the, the phone with us, and I said, you know, do you know of any other of the national estuary programs among the 28 nationally that kind of pivoted quickly to do a COVID response? And, and to my knowledge and his, the only other one is the Lower Columbia uh, River Partnership. And so I just wanted to thank you all for, you know, doing what we said in the very beginning. You said you didn't want to be bureaucratic, that you wanted to be able to make adaptive decisions you know, as quickly as we could. And this is a perfect example of having an opportunity to help some people, individuals, in a time of crisis. And, and uh, you as a board, I think, should be congratulated for both making that budget decision and the policy decision. And we've got five individuals that are very happy to be part of the team temporarily. So thank you. Yes, yes, and we're, the added benefit is we're getting much needed information um, and utilizing those uh, skill sets from people that have the time to do it right now. So all in all, I think this is a great program and I'm really looking forward to the end result. Um, with that, we'll move on to our Indian River Lagoon project updates by Daniel. Exciting stuff. All right. So I'm just going to give you guys an update on all of our contracts and, and progress and some of the projects that finished. So as of um, last month's quarter ending, we had 43 contracted projects in progress, uh, four small grants from our old run still in progress. We contracted uh, six of the new ones that were um, approved back in May. Uh, five COVID grants, as Kathy just went over, are under contract now. And uh, we finished since the beginning of this fiscal year, uh, eight projects and five of them were in quarter three alone. Um, something that's not on this slide as well is that we are about to wrap up our first of our five year EPA grant. Um, so something that came up in the finance subcommittee that was kind of interesting was, they said, why is there you know, funding over here and funding over here for a same project? Well, it's on two different grants. So we are managing two grants at the same time. I'm really excited to wrap that one up at the end of this calendar year be on one so next slide <clears throat> so our first project that finished uh, was back in December 2019 as Bob alluded to this was the Indian River County West Wabasso septic to sewer this actually came up in last meeting uh, for funding to help with uh, set, um, Sewell's Point's uh, project as you can see here they were Originally awarded 200,000 when it came to final reimbursement amount, they were $68,000, 68,219 under budget. Um, some of the highlights from this project was that all 101 parcels were connected. Um, they're estimating 3,000 pounds of t total nitrogen and 500 pounds of total phosphorus per year reduced. And this is in a um, economically challenged area. So pretty big stuff. Next project. Um, R.W. Parkinson's uh, finished the Climate Estuary Ready Estuary Program project. This is completed in March of 2020. Um, it was an EPA, EPA supplemental grant of 52000 It finished on budget. And I'm going to open this to Dwayne for just a brief comment about uh, some of the highlights of this project. Uh, just very briefly, uh, we will be one of only two NEPs to have finished this EPA process. Uh, Puerto Rico was the first and a couple things that are happening with this that are really interesting and, and number one is that the process itself went from having over 400 different potential actions for climate change down to what you see here. So the team was very prescriptive in how they would direct us as an NEP on the things that we do as an NEP. And so 
the process on EPA is really water quality and not infrastructure oriented. And because the process that Randy Parkinson and the Balmoral team employed, which I think is going to be a model for the, the NEPs nationwide, uh, it actually wound up, if you look at this graph, they, they took these multiple stressors and actions, and now we've got three stressors and nine adaptation actions to focus on over the next 10 years. And amazingly enough, even though we started in the water, you know, and environmental world, all of those actions relate to exactly where council has been since day one. Let's fix the infrastructure. Stormwater, wastewater, muck dredging, pollutant loadings, that's the biggest bang for the buck if we want resilient communities uh, as sea level rises and climate change. So a great document. It's in my hands now, and so I'm taking the two plans, merging it into one, and in November, you will get to adopt that final, you know, synthesized plan, and we're putting together a community guide because this is a technical document so general citizens can get an idea of you know what the major recommendations are so very exciting stuff thank you the epa headquarters and region four this work work would not have happened without epa supplemental grants in 1718. that's all i have madam chair thank you next slide healing uh, Bavard Zoo wrapped up their Restore Our Shores 2018-2019. They had some permitting constraints, but finally got that all squared away and completed this project in April of 2020. Uh, they were on budget. Um, some of the highlights from this was they planted over 3,600 plants along 965 feet of shoreline. Uh, they held 91 community events, had 800 linear feet of oyster reef installed, and had over 3,000 volunteer hours. Next slide. Um, University of Central Florida finished their phase two of a shoreline suitability model for the North IRL and Mosquito Lagoon. Phase one was kind of just a mapping of that entire area. Uh, this second phase looked at how, how much of the shoreline could sustain mangroves, and they found that 68% uh, could only handle 50% um, of mangroves, and that was all due to wave height. So as there's a more wave height, more wind energy, um, they couldn't have mangroves, and this project was $127.19 under budget. FDEP finished up the Aquatic Preserve Shoreline Restoration in Brevard County project in May of 2020. They were $652.69 under budget. They had over 1,000 volunteer hours. Uh, they planted over 228 square meters of red mangroves on Brevard County Spoil Island number 45. And over several other spoil islands, they had a, over an acre and a half of bird nesting habitat created by removing exotic Brazilian peppers and Australian pines. They also started their horseshoe crab tagging pro program. Bard County finished their channel denitrification construction project in June of 2020. It was originally 32,000. They were $21,650 under budget. Uh, this project is still being uh, in progress with Brevard County on their side for the monitoring. Um, it's a bioreactor facilitated with calcareous rock and charcoal briskets, hopefully to do nutrient reduction and uh, results will be incoming. Next. Hub SeaWorld Research Institute uh, finished their project in June 2020. This uh, project was on budget. You may remember from several meetings ago, um, we had some information from our board chairs regarding mercury in, uh, in the lagoon and that the IRL dolphins had some of the highest mercury ever recorded. However, selenium is maybe protective against that mercury contamination. Some other data found in this was that uh, the isotopes of nitrogen from wastewater seems to be going down over time. So that's uh, indication possibly of reduced uh, wastewater discharges to the lagoon. Next project. And finally, Bethune-Cookman uh, University finished their Reed Canal Basin Stormwater Improvement. Um, I don't know the exact number on this one yet. I'm still waiting a little bit of uh, invoice uh, and, and cost share backup for this, but 
from what I initially see, it looks like they're going to be well under budget too. Um, as you can see in the before and after, they completely cleared, regraded, and planted multiple uh, mangroves and other plants at this stormwater park in Reed Canal. And they also hosted a six-day Protect Our Lagoon Academy at the BJ Moore Center um, back in July 2019. And I expect several more projects to finish in this next quarter, so hopefully November we'll have quite another finished project update. That's all I have. Thank you. Wonderful. Does anybody have any questions on the project update? No? Okay. Well, we look forward to um, more updates in November. It's good to see all these projects starting to become uh, getting completed and done and, and seeing the fruits of our labors here. Um, with that, we'll move on to new business. Our first item under new business is 12A, the EPA Competitive Grants Program administered by Restore America's Estuaries. Um, Dr. DeFries. Or is this... Oh, hold on. You're there. You go. Perfect. Thanks, Chair. Before I actually start with this grants program, uh, Jennifer DeMeo, when we first began this meeting, mentioned the South. Doctor DeFree. Oh, yeah. Hold on a second. You've got the robotic voice going on. I'm gonna pull out and pull in. Okay. For those of you online, we have learned over the past couple of months of doing a gazillion Zoom meetings that if that happens to you, one of the things you can do is pop out and pop back in and it seems to clear it up. What we also found out is if you have a headset, even just a simple one for your phone, if you plug that in, it'll override that microphone issue. So keeping one handy when you're on Zoom meetings these days is kind of a good thing. We've all learned so much in this process, whether we wanted to or not. <laughs> all right, well, I know he's gonna pop back in here in a second. But once everything is done, we will need a, let, we will need a motion um, to move forward if that is what the will of the board is. Maybe it just wasn't a robotic voice problem, Kayleen. No, he's there. Okay. He's, he's coming. Hang on, you're muted. There, there you, you go. go. How does that sound a little better? That's better. Okay. My apologies. You know, high tech, something always goes wrong. Uh, what I wanted to just mention, and I'll start from the beginning again, is when Jennifer DeMeo mentioned the South Florida Regional Initiative, uh, RFP that was on the street. Um, I, I just wanted to use this moment to thank Congressman Brian Mast and also Congressman Michael Waltz up in Volusia. The reason that is bringing dollars potentially uh, to the Indian River Lagoon is because of a congressional amendment on that South Florida Clean Water Act that included the Indian River Lagoon in language. And so that is one RFP on the street right now. And this is the second EPA grant on the street. Um, next slide. So back in 2016, during our reauthorization pro process, Congress added a competitive grants program within Section 320 of the Clean Water Act. Uh, the EPA uh, contracted with America's Restore America's estuaries to administer. So this is the first call on that new competitive grants program. So the RFP was issued May 6th. Uh, we were on a informal webinar on June 3rd and over, I heard 600 people were on that call. So this is a national grants program, which will be very competitive. Letters of intent are due August 7th. If you are invited and to put a full proposal, the due date will be November 7th and awards uh, will come sometime, we're thinking early in 2021. Next slide. Part of this program uh, mandated that any proposer who brought a letter of intent through the program 
had to have a letter of acknowledgement from a national estuary program. And so I've been handling that, uh, that workload. Uh, to date, I've signed and, and crafted 10 letters of intent, these acknowledgement letters. I have three more over the last two days that need to be filled. One of the questions that came up very early in this process, starting a month ago, almost everybody wanted council and the NEP to become a partner. And we are limited. In fact, everybody is limited to just three partnerships. And so I made a, a executive decision that we wouldn't partner uh, with our, you know, friends out there. We would support their support them with letters, but that we would try to find a couple of proposals that were transformational, very specific to what we want to do as a national estuary program in council, and that we would actually directly apply and begin to mature as a national estuary program to meet one of the four goals that you set out in the very beginning, and that's to expand revenues, programmatic revenues. Next slide. So where we are right now, based on our knowledge, 13 proposals will be submitted. Uh, most of those are in our watershed, one is not. Uh, we know the, that the Association of National Estuary Programs will be submitting three, kind of on a national level. Um, we also are not partnering directly with those uh, but bullet number two, developing a standard methodology for economic valuation. I don't know how it happened, but I'm writing that one on behalf of ANEP. And so that'll be my weekend. And next slide. And the request from council today, uh, which was supported by our advisory committees, is to give us authority as staff to submit two letters of intent should those letters of intent uh, be invited for full proposals, that we would move forward uh, with full proposal submission. And I wanna just briefly outline the two. I'll start with the second one because you've already seen the possibilities. So the second proposal is with St. John's River Water Management District. Many thanks to Chuck Jacoby, Dr. Jacoby, has taken the heavy lift of writing this one, uh, but it would be taking that predictive tool that we showed you on 528 and then improving it, expanding it with the idea that at some point we may be able to use that tool to evaluate projects when they come to us based on their benefit to lagoon water quality. And so we see this as a possible tool not only good for us, but possibly the whole state of Florida as a predictive model. And the second I'm writing is with a private company called Storm Center Communications out of Maryland. And the short story there is that they have a unique software technology that was developed with about a million dollars worth of federal funding through the Small Business Innovation Research Grants Program with NOAA. And this allows multiple parties on a meeting like we're doing now, a Zoom meeting, to look at different data sets simultaneously and in a visual platform. So the main outcome of this two-year project uh, would be that in the second year, we would actually have a workshop within the NEP and it's focused on harmful algal blooms. And many of you in, in government agencies know that you do emergency scenario planning for hurricanes, you know, for you know, other possible emergency events that we would actually do a harmful algal bloom emergency scenario workshop using geo-collaborate software and to demonstrate the power of this platform to communicate at levels that are unmatched anywhere. And so they are now, uh, Storm Center is now under a, a it's called a phase three long-term SBIR commitment from NOAA. Software is being used by the National Weather Service, U.S. Census Bureau, 
we understand that uh, they may be actually just starting to work with, you know, the Hurricane Center. And, and so if this works the way we hope, if we're lucky enough to get a proposal and, and win an award, this may very well be an item we bring back to council um, as a long-term private-public relationship uh, with the council and the NEP. And so uh, the action request is to give us authority to submit. Both of these proposals have a 33% match. Uh, we, have, we have the ability to match both with dollars in hand, either in reserve or in budget uh, for the upcoming fiscal year 2021. Should we get an award, we'll have to do a budget amendment and put a line item for this project. So that's all I have other than questions but I'm excited that we're moving into this kind of new maturity where we're gonna start chasing grants and new revenues. Madam Chair. Awesome, thank you. Are there any questions or comments for Dr. DeFries on this? Yes, Chris. Uh, Dwayne, is there, is there a complete package uh, of this information, the, the uh, proposal and the parameters of the grants uh, exactly that our uh, grant writers can review. It's a short period of time between now and August 7th. Um, but, uh, and I, I, unfortunately, I don't have my packet with me here in my home. I, I didn't go to the office this morning and I, I don't have it. Let's see if it was we're, in there. We're happy to submit it. Uh, th these are proposals that are in progress as we speak. So we've been meeting almost daily this week because of the short timeline. Uh, these letters of intent, um, they do have a detailed budget, uh, but basically it's about a six-page document that, you know, have, you have to demonstrate, you know, alignment with the, you know, the federal sense of urgency on this, uh, which is nutrients, uh, resilience, you know, harmful algal blooms. Um, and so we're happy to send those proposals out I suspect that we should have those pretty clean by Monday, Tuesday. Uh, but we are working hard on trying to meet those deadlines. Okay, well, maybe in the future, because, uh, you know, the St. Lucie County has been trying to move the uh, wastewater plant from the lagoon on South Beach uh, and uh, move to new technologies to deal with biosolids. Um, and it sounds like uh, that, that element would be a really a good focus if we could... Um, see that come back in the future and, and kind of put that in there somewhere. Commissioner, this is probably not an appropriate vehicle for that, uh, but uh, we may mention it later, but I'll mention it um, now. There is $25 million available through St. John's, you know, from the legislative package. Uh, that is on the street as another RFP right now. And then there's going to be, I understand, additional, and I don't know the timeline on it, but DEP got money from the legislature and the governor for innovative projects as it relates to water quality harmful algal blooms. So uh, I'll get together, I'll follow up with you and staff and uh, maybe help direct. And everybody should remember on council, uh, we still have money in this fiscal year left for writing proposals. Um, we have never completely expended our grant support line item budget. And um, I hate leaving money on the table. And so we've been very successful supplying our partners uh, with professional grant writers to help you all chase money. Um, and so that is still available this year. Dan, I don't know uh, exactly what's left in that budget, but uh, it's first come, first serve until that 25000 is spent. And so if you're chasing grants between now and end of uh, this fiscal year, let us know. We still have money available to assist in grant writing once you identify that target. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments? Let's see, seeing none, we <clears throat> will need a motion to approve participation as a partner in two letters of intent, if invited to do so. Motion do we have a so moved. 
Thank you, Commissioner Smith. Second, uh, Wheeler. Thank you, Ms. Wheeler. All right, we have a motion and a second. We'll go ahead and, oh, is there any public comment? I'm so sorry, I forgot to take public comment. All right, seeing none, then we'll go ahead and do a roll call. Um, Doug? Yes. Chris? Stacy? Yes. Jackie? Yes. Kurt? Yes. Billy? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Thank you, everyone. Sorry, I'm behind you. And with that, oh, I'm sorry, Jason, I forgot you as well. I'm really, I'm not doing well at all with this. I need to make another cup of coffee. I need to make another cup of coffee and regroup. All right. We will move on to item 12B, which is expanding revenue with merchandising. Kathy Hill. Great. So um, we have been working with our ideas folks uh, for a, a few years now, and uh, they developed our website for us, if you recall. And one of the things that they started um, planting seeds with uh, just as soon as they came on was the need for an online store. And so we, we've heard that call and with over 100 folks in our management conference now, we can barely get through any conversation anymore without somebody saying, when are the hats coming? When are the t-shirts coming? When are the polos coming? Uh, so now they're coming. Um, we have decided that it's time to prove that concept and see if we have a market for merchandising. Um, and, and we decided to do it uh, to start small and then to grow bigger. Um, so the start small idea is we will, we will host an online store on our website just to prove the concept that we have a market for merchandising with the long view that down the road, we would seek out um, a licensing agreement with the company to do merchandising for us. And that would be a seamless thing. So somebody would be able to come onto our website. They would see an online store. It would not be staff running it. It would be a licensing company running it, but it would be seamless. Nobody would know that it's not us doing it. Um, so that that's sort of the long view. But in the short term, um, I just wanted to show you what this is going to look like should you approve it today. Uh, and we decided just hats, polos, and t-shirts to start with. Um, and so the idea is we're gonna do embroidered hats and embroidered polo shirts, um, both high quality, 100% cotton, uh, and t-shirts, also 100% cotton, that are silk screened with uh, one lagoon on the front and they will have the logo on the back. And you can see all of those there. So the, uh, the initial cost for this, and we're requesting that it come out of reserve since we're at the end of the year and we have, we have a, a lot of money in reserve, this, this should not uh, hurt our position any. Um, to do 500 shirts, uh, t-shirts, 500 polos and 500 caps, um, the purchase price for those just out of the gate is $18,800 um, after sales. And we're hoping that if we can get approval today, we will start this process immediately and capture holiday buying for folks. So we'll be uh, plugging this availability soon. And we hope that uh, you will share this in your communities and uh, within you know, your staffs and anybody who has interest in, in this merchandise can take advantage. Um, but we're predicting a gross, uh, gross sales of 39.9. So that will pay back the, uh, the initial cost into reserve and it would leave sort of a net profit after, you know, mailing supplies and, and things of that nature of about 20,000 for. Now take any questions you might have. All right, are there any questions for Kathy on this? Any comments? No. All Thanks. right. Is there any yes. public comments? Madam Chair? Yes. Yes, Kurt. Uh, my chat button obviously doesn't work. Um, yes, I have a comment. In our uh, discussion yesterday during my briefing, I questioned why we're not doing on water, on the water apparel. Like, um, I call them head socks, but Dwayne corrected me and said they're called buffs and long sleeve dry fit um, because I wear them. And when I'm out on the water, 
I see countless people, fishermen, et cetera, that wear the long sleeves and cover up with the buffs. So I just wanted to bring it up to the rest of the board to see what your thoughts were. Aileen, do we have that slide of future merchandising that's still in there? Okay, we don't have that, but uh, we, we have priced out that, that part of things. So if, um, you know, this is the opportunity, if you wanted to add to what we thought the, the initial store should look like, we would be happy to do that. Kurt, would you like to see those two items added to the initial round of merchandise? Yes, I would. I think that they're, I personally think they'll be the biggest seller. I know that people that like the lagoon and drive across the causeways and, and support what we're doing are going to wear the hats and the t-shirts and the polo shirts. But I think the people that are going to be on the lagoon would love to see the long sleeve, sun protected clothing, as well as the buffs or head socks. Because I can tell you when I'm out on the water, there's not a square inch of skin showing. I'm completely covered up because I've already had melanoma and other skin cancers and uh, my skin doctor tells me I shouldn't be in the sun at all. So I'm not gonna give up being on the water, but I do as he says and I cover completely up. So those long sleeves help and I, I can tell you um, the other fishermen and the other people that I see boating, they're, they're out there by the dozens, probably the hundreds that are wearing them. So I think that it would be a, a good addition for us. Okay, I don't disagree. I think that's that's a a good idea. Um, does anybody else have any comments or questions? Madam this, Chair, yes. Hey, th hey, this is Jennifer. Um, I can't tell if on the T-shirts or not. Does it say um, Indian River Lagoon on the T-shirt? Um, the, the graphic that you have here does not, but it will. Okay. So I, this was a quick whip up to show what it could look like, and we left off the uh, the heavy text on it. Gotcha. Because I understand, like on the on the um, the polos and the hats, you know, it's limited, and we definitely mm -hmm. want to get the one lagoon. But on the regular T-shirts on the back, I was thinking that um, you may want to put Indian River Lagoon on there as well as one lagoon. Yeah, we do, um, and okay. that that was that was my mistake. I'll second. Did that motion include? Did that motion include adding the sun shirts and um, the buffs? Yes, it did. Okay. Okay. Great. Wonderful. So then I have a I have a motion by Commissioner Wheeler with a second by Commissioner Hetherington. Any public comment? Any further discussion? Seeing none, then we will have a roll call. Madam Chair, looks like. Uh, Oh. Bob has his hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. Bob, did you have a request for a specific swag? I will hold on, you're, you're muted. Hang on, Bob. There you go, Bob. Make sure we have the chunky size available for me, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Duly noted. We'll get that. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> All right, um, we'll start the roll call. Doug? Uh, yes. Chris? Yes. Stacy? Yes. Jackie? Yes. Kurt? Yes. Jason? Yes. Billy? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Thank you guys for that. I'm looking, looking forward to wearing all my stuff at our next meeting. All right, we'll move on to item 12C, which is our meeting calendar for 2021. Kayleen? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to drop off. I think we had a little power glitch and the box had to reset. Um, you all received your calendars and your packets. We're just looking for an approval of the selected dates. 
we did all of our due diligence, went out and make sure they weren't conflicting with anything that we could find um, on published calendars, although not many of your organizations have published the calendars for 2021, but we kind of followed the trend and felt that Fridays have seemed to be working well for everyone. Um, we're just looking for an approval of these dates and the times. Location will go back to the city of Sebastian once we're able to meet again in person. Until then, we'll continue Zoom. Fantastic. Does anybody have any comments or questions on the calendar? If not, then we will need a motion uh, to approve the IRL NEP 2021 meeting calendar. Motion to approve, Wheeler. Thank you, and I'll go ahead and second that. Is there any public comment? Seeing none, and we'll have a roll call. We'll start with Doug. Yes. Chris? Yes. Stacy? Yes. Jackie? Yes. Kurt? Yes. Jason? Yes. Billy? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Thank you, everybody. And then we'll move on to item 12D, which is our legal update by Ms. Carolyn Ansay. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. I am uh, today bringing you knowledge with most of you already that I will be uh, leaving my private practice and my law firm to join the South Water Management District General Counsel. I will be uh, doing that next week. So this will be my final board meeting with the IRL Council. I am uh, extremely uh, honored to have been a part of this organization uh, back in 2014 when I was first contacted to try to help facilitate uh, bringing together the local parties in the Water Management District and DEP to form some sort of an organization to host the NEP. It was uh, a real exciting and interesting process as we went through that design team to create uh, the interlocal agreement organization that exists today. You've uh, hired phenomenal staff in Dr. DeFries and Kathy, Kayleen and Dan. Um, they are a pleasure to work with and I will miss working with them. Um, I'll miss working with all of you as well. Uh, with that, uh, my law firm and my partner Glenn Torsivier, he's on the meeting today. Uh, we have uh, been working with staff to manage the contracts. Uh, they are ready and able to assume the spot. Glenn had attended some of the meetings uh, in my absence over the years. And so that, uh, I would uh, just say the only thing we would need to do to make the transition effective would be to board authorize the chair and the staff to uh, enter into a slightly revised agreement with the law firm. Since I'll be leaving, my name will come off the firm, so the firm name will change. That will change and designate Mr. Torsivia as the firm's representative, but all other terms of the agreement would remain the same. Um, and if you have any other questions, uh, let me know, and I will uh, prefer to come back and attend a meeting in Jur as it's, it's just, I think the organization's fantastic, and I will miss you all very much. So with that, Madam Chair, if there are any questions. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to say that it has been a pleasure working with you these years. You bring such a level of professionalism to that position. Um, we're, we're very lucky. And while I am very excited for you and your new adventure, um, it's a great opportunity. I'm definitely going to miss you and the organization is, is going to miss you. But I know we'll be in good hands with Glenn. So we're looking forward to getting to know him. Um, but Congratulations to you, Carolyn. That's a really exciting adventure you're getting ready to go on. Um, is there any questions for Carolyn on this? Not a question, just want to remember us whenever you're there and you know where money is and uh, where we need it. And uh, be sure to tell uh, Dwayne, uh, I mean, uh, Drew, uh, that we're best friends, okay? <laughs> Can't miss an opportunity. <laughs> I don't blame you, Chris. I don't blame you. All right. Are there any other questions or concerns? If not, then we will need a motion to authorize staff and the chair to enter into an updated agreement with legal counsel to recognize Trisivia, Donlin, and 
that whole name that I'm not going to try to pronounce because I'm just going to go, I'm having issues this morning anyway. And Glenn as a designated. Motion to yep. Thank you, Commissioner Wheeler. There is a motion by Commissioner Wheeler and I will go ahead and second that. Is there any public comment? Seeing none, then we'll have a roll call. We'll start with Doug. A reluctant yes. <laughs> Noted. Chris? No. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to count that as a yes. But <laughs> yes. yes. Stacy? Yes, and congratulations, Carolyn. We will miss you. Jackie? Congratulations, Carolyn. Great to have you. I know we should be mad at Jackie. She stole. Yeah. Her. <laughs> All right, Kurt. Give her back. Give her back. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to echo the well wishes, Carolyn. Um, it was 2014 when I first met you, and gosh, time flies. So, congratulations and good luck. Thank you, Kurt. Jason. Yes, and congratulations, Carolyn. I'll be I'll be seeing you a lot more often. Billy? Yes, and congratulations and good luck, Carolyn. And I'm a yes as well, and congratulations. And welcome, Glenn. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate it. And I'm, as I've told each of you over the last few days, uh, very excited. We all know there's big shoes to fill with Carolyn, but I will do the best I can. I'm happy to be on the team. We're happy to have you. Looking forward to it. All right, with that, we will move on to 12E. This is the added um, agenda item, uh, and this is going to be about council staff operational issues. Um, when I was talking with uh, Dr. DeFries, we were discussing some of the COVID-19 issues and some other issues that <clears throat> um, he's facing personally, and just about leadership transition and making sure we have all of our ducks in a row um, for that. So I just kind of added this item to the agenda to make sure that Dwayne has the authority from us as the board of directors to delegate his authority as executive director by memorandum to the deputy director if needed. I think that that's always kind of been our understanding and maybe a consensus, but with everything going on, I just wanted to make sure that it was clear um, that he has the ability to do that if something were to arise. So does anybody have any questions on that or any discussion or want to add anything? No? Okay. So if that's okay with everybody, then I just think we need to make a motion to confirm the authority of our executive director to delegate his authority by written memorandum to the deputy director and to communicate action to the board members and alternates. So move, Madam Chair, Chris with Austin. Second, and Austin. Darrington. Thank you very much. We have a motion by Commissioner Zadowski and a second by Commissioner Hetherington. Is there any public comment on this? I'm not seeing any. Okay, then we will have a roll call. Um, Doug? Yes. Chris? Yes. Stacy? Yes. Jackie? Yes. Kurt? Yes. Jason? Yes. Billy? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. And thank you guys for that. I think it just provides some clarification for everybody. And with that, we will move on to the executive director's report. Dr. DeFries, you're up. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've got four pretty brief points. Uh, first is that um, this past week, uh, we distributed one of our, uh, it's a mandatory supplemental to the CCMP. So there's a number of documents that go through EPA review once our comprehensive conservation and management plan gets adopted. It includes a communication plan, the monitoring plan, which you're gonna see over the next months and into next year. Uh, but staff, and I wanna thank Kathy, uh, we drafted a strategy for financing the CCMP document uh, with the intention last week of submitting it first to the 
a finance subcommittee, you know, kind of leaving it as a partial embargo and then getting, you know, input back. It was so much interest that we went ahead and broadcast it and, and made it a public review period. And so each of you have been um, sent a copy of that. And I want you to understand what it is and kind of what we're looking for. Please share it with any and all staff members within your organizations. This is not a prescriptive document. So we're not telling you know, the EPA or the state of Florida or any of your counties or agencies, you know, this is how you would fund a $5 billion restoration package for the lagoon. What it is though, is a document that says, here are the avenues for revenues within the state of Florida, as well as some of the specific funding opportunities, for example, within HUD at the federal level or NOAA at the federal level. And the, the message here is, if we need four to five billion over the next 20 years, you know, we're looking at 250 million a year. How do you get there? And then what are some of the considerations? So the plan is to get comments back by August 15th. I will assemble all those comments into a final draft document. We will submit that document to EPA Region 4 and headquarters so they can review it for a consensus very similar to what we did with the CCMP with certification. So they'll look at a consensus review. And then my hope is that we will bring this document back to you at our November meeting for adoption. And I know Kathy's working on a communication plan that we hope will be ready by then too. I just wanted to let you know that's out on the street, but don't hold on to it. And, and normally you might give it to your natural resources people. I mean, feel free to share it with the county managers, your financial folks. Where I think there's an opportunity is I may have forgotten something. Some unique, you know, aspect of revenue that you in a city or you in a county might look at. And I know that uh, Stu Glass on our subcommittee has already sent it out to the Space Coast League of Cities for review. So anyway, just wanted to encourage mass distribution uh, so I can get as much input back over the next 15 days to a month. That's item number one. Item number two, I'll be very brief. We are in a very complicated and fast moving federal reappropriation status. You know, thanks to our legislative delegation up in Washington, especially uh, Senator Rubio, uh, we are now embedded in the Senate version of WERDA. Uh, this week, the House committee passed the House version of the WERDA bill. Um, at some point, probably mid-August, we're expecting a bypass of, you know, Senate floor debate, and this may actually go to what's called committee conference. And so there is a chance, if everything works well, uh, that we will be able to reconcile the Senate and House. This House can't take this up because of their rules. So when we come to conference, our hope is that we will be reauthorized as WERDA moves forward for congressional reauthorization, you know, on or before uh, November elections. Our backup, which isn't much of a backup, is we still have Senate Bill 3171 and House Bill um, HR 4044 with bipartisan support but to be honest, there's not a lot of time between now and November to move those independently. Although also thank you to Senator Rubio's office. Uh, he has signed on as a Senate co-sponsor on the Senate bill. So stay tuned on that. Literally, I'm, I'm seeing emails and conversations a couple times a week and some days it's three or four a day, but we are alive for reauthorization. Um, I want to at least give you a, a reality check that I don't anticipate any change in appropriation. I think conservatively speaking, you know, we probably won't see any budget decisions now going into an election. So we'll probably see continuing resolutions and no bump ups 
all of the language has us at a doubled amount. So $50 million uh, for the reauthorization. So good news there, but we have to stay on it. Um, really briefly, and this is new news, I didn't brief any of it because I was waiting to get a little sense of where we were. Um, I have been talking over the last several months to St. John's River Water Management District about the possibility of doing an administrative and legislative transfer of the Indian River Lagoon specialty license plate to transfer that administrative oversight from St. John's to the IRL Council. Um, and, and if we were to move that forward, we would have to go through a legislative amendment. There's a process to that. And so I just wanted to, and we will work closely. I know there's been discussions with South Florida. You know, we're seeing this, you know, almost as the same delivery system that we have now. The only shift would be that we would bring this in and then begin to do a dedicated focus, branding, marketing, and art update on that license plate once it came over to us to see if we can at least double those revenues that are coming in. They've been flat, in fact, been declining slowly over the years. So I'd like to get a sense whether there's any objection, you know, from council as I work with Ann Shortell and her team in the South Florida Water Management District. Um, so I'm comfortable, should we start to trigger motion on this, that I've got your support to do so. Um, because the discussions are gonna happen quick in committee um, starting really next month. Yeah, I think that, I think anything we can do to help um, shore up those revenue sources is good for us, for sure. You know, Dwayne, Doug, Borney, uh, Madam Chairman, I've, I've moved, so if he needs a motion of, or uh, a sentiment from the board, I so move. I don't think I need a motion on this one, but I do wanted to make sure that there weren't any objections. We have a long way to go before the legislative session, uh, but I, I did not want to make that move without knowing you supported the, the activity. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of head nodding and support. So <clears throat> I know legislative session things move fast and everything kind of gets lined up beforehand. So definitely I think um, if you start working on it now, that will be perfect. And then maybe we just get an update in November. And if you need a specific motion at that point, we can go from there. Fantastic, thank you. And lastly, um, both on a professional and a personal note, I want to uh, welcome you know, Glenn Torsivia to the team. Uh, Glenn briefed us all on multiple briefings, so we let him drink from the fire hose this week. And so I'm glad you all got some time to chat with him in our briefings. But I'd be remiss not to, you know, say thank you to Carolyn Anse. And, and Carolyn, I've worked with a lot of attorneys and law firms in my career, and, and I've never worked uh, with legal counsel or a firm that's been more responsive, more professional, you know, more accommodating to getting the job done and also making sure we don't mess up on our end when we think we understand the law and actually we don't. But many of you don't understand how valuable Carolyn's been. Uh, I can honestly say without reservation that we would not be here today had it not been for her participation, not just as legal counsel, but as a trusted uh, team member for me and, and an executive counsel to me. So I can tell you more than a few times making that phone call on her cell phone when she's down in the Bahamas with her family on a boat or on a weekend, you know, asking questions about federal water policy, you know, Everglades restoration, even the the political question of, you know, who's this person down in Martin in St. Lucie County and do I need to meet them? And every time, you know, I've always gotten, gotten sage, trusted, truthful advice. And so you will be truly missed. It's been my honor and pleasure to work with you. Uh, I hate to tell you, but um, we are like the mafia. You may be working for Drew Bartlett now, but you are never. <laughs> out of the family, 
And so you will always be a family member of the council and the NEP. We look forward to working with you in this new role, forward to working with Glenn, but uh, you're stuck with us for the duration, um, even if you're working for somebody else. So thank you so much. Your friendship and your professional guidance has been absolutely essential to my success. I wanted you to know how much I appreciate it. It's been an honor to work with you, so thank you. Dwayne, could you have told her this like three months ago so she'd have stayed? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm going to bring this up just now because it's, you all should know that uh, we engaged the, the law firm back in, I believe it was 2014 before I was even hired. We have never spent that full budget amount in our budgets. In fact, this year we're significantly under that amount, nor have they ever increased their legal fees on an hourly basis since we've started this in 2014. So it's pretty amazing when you have a law firm that's also an advocate for what you're doing, and that's a rarity in this business. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. We're getting tremendous value and service. And I uh, hate to put the pressure on you, Glenn, but, uh, you know, welcome. Yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs> no, it's, uh, I'm going to miss Carolyn, although she's a phone call away. We've been friends for years. Um, and she has done, you know, from my vantage point, you know, from 20,000 people watching for the last few years, she's done amazing. And uh, I know you're all going to miss her. I'm going to do my best to try and come close to measuring up to her. We have faith Thank in you, you Glenn. <laughs> Madam Chair, that's it for my report. All right. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll move into Indian River Lagoon Council member reports. And I'm just going to go down the list. If anybody has anything, speak up. Um, Doug, you're first. Yeah, Madam Chairman. I've got a couple of things real quick. Um, uh, Dwayne, on the uh, 528 bridge, just as a note, in uh, 1985, when they were building the Indian River high span, the 17th Street Bridge, they stopped construction of that big bridge uh, for months because of a island right next to the bridge was a rockery. So they do listen to environmental issues and it, and the lagoon is a much bigger issue than one small spoil island rookery. It's, I, I think they'll listen to you on that, and um, I, I, I think if we push hard enough, we'll be successful in that. That's number one. And to go along with that, Dwayne, I, I mentioned this to you the other day. I think all the counties of the northern Palm Beach County up to uh, Southern to one lagoon drive. I think US one ought to be renamed as long as we're coming out with, with shirts and t shirts and on the lagoon. US one needs to be renamed to one lagoon. And lastly, um, I'm asking that for our next agenda that uh, we have. Uh, I haven't heard anything about that or where it is for looking at flushing out the lagoon at certain points, and I'd like to see an update on that. An update on flushing? Yes. Okay. I'll extend an invitation to uh, Florida Institute of Technology to give a presentation to council in November. Fantastic. All right, Chris, you have anything? Uh, I'm sure I do, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Duly noted. All right. Stacy, anything to report? Uh, I'll just give a quick update um, from Martin County since I wasn't here last um, meeting. We have, we have certainly been having our special meetings on Friday, uh, Fridays weekly, so I'm sorry I missed you all um, last time. I certainly would rather be participating in this meeting than our, our special meetings. So. The, um, this week, Martin County um, started the beginning of its new water, uh, water monitoring program. So we'll be doing some of our own surface water quality monitoring to complement some of South Florida water management's data. And this will be used to develop some project ideas um, for stormwater retrofit needs. 
And um, we also will be kicking off our water quality needs assessment update. And we're continuing forward with our septic to sewer conversion goals. We had a goal of um, 10,000 tanks over the next 10 years, and we've committed $4 million per year um, to do that. Our next project that we're looking forward to is Old Palm City, which will remove 700 connections. So um, we just received some funding this last session for Golden Gate septic to sewer. I want to say that one was around um, four to six hundred, four firm eighty um, removals. And um, as far as our, we're we're going to be starting an innovative technology. Um, program where we'll be queuing up and presenting some proposals to DEP for, for uh, funding. One will be um, the water treatment uh, tropical farms um, and then another one will be some surface treatment on C44. So some exciting things going on in um, Martin County and then we continue to have our team working on LOSM. So that's all for us. Wonderful. It's good to hear all that fun stuff happening down there, Stacy. Jackie, anything to report? Yes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to apologize for me shifting around and having a shell in front of you for over half the meeting. I, I just learned that on an iPad, I don't have full view, nor do I have view of myself. So I am very sorry for everything. What a ridiculous situation. I will improve next time. Um, for a South Florida water, so now I'm out on the porch because we're putting up the hurricane shutters. So my reception was getting bad. So this should be the, the worst I ever get. Um, a few things from the South Florida Water Management District. Um, you may have heard that we are doing, uh, they, they allotted just over a million dollars for monitoring of Lake Okeechobee sediment discharges, which will be done uh, as a test with uh, how it triggers uh, or doesn't trigger blue-green algae blooms. So we're very excited of, about that. Um, the Northern Estuaries Protection Program, which is uh, combined with the 40E61, which is Florida um, Code, Florida uh, FAC, Florida Code, uh, has been very difficult, I'll just be straight. Um, the district spent about a year uh, working on two different aspects to this, and right at the very last minute, the state legislature nullified basically all of part one, uh, because the legislature wants to be very clear, and what they want, I always picture kind of a triangle, and they want uh, FDACs to be in charge of BMPs, and uh, kind of, you know, letting people know whether they're doing meeting them or not meeting them. And then DEP at the top of the triangle would be in charge of uh, the BMAPs, but also uh, dealing with anybody who wasn't doing what they were supposed to be doing. And the South Florida Water Management District would be in charge of monitoring, completely of monitoring. And uh, it, the original way it was working out, we were kind of doing uh, some of the uh, judgment of whether things were being met or not. So uh, we'll adapt. And the last big thing is a project partnership agreement for SEP, which is, of course, the, the six elements of SERP or so that really focus on moving water south in the bottom of the system. So that is um, great to have that uh, share between us and the Army Corps. They're working really hard to push this water south and to make this something that works. And uh, I just feel like I'm the luckiest person in the world that Carolyn Anse is coming to the South Florida Water Management District. So uh, thank you everybody and please uh, all the best, be safe. Thank you, Jackie, and you too. Good luck with your shutter extravaganza. I know how much fun that can be. All right, Kurt. Thank you, Madam yep. Chair. Uh, during this meeting, I realized we have another potential ally in our discussion with FDOT regarding State Road 528. And let me give you a little background. And that, that's, of course, if the council is interested in having another ally, and I'm sure we are. But let me give you a little bit of background, uh, just so you understand 
Back in 2017, when I was board chair of Brevard County Commission, I discovered that Brevard County was not a member of the Central Florida Expressway Authority. So I appeared before their board and made my pitch on behalf of Brevard County and to add Brevard County to the Central Florida Expressway Authority, and they agreed. I now sit on that CFX board, and we just so happen to be currently in, in discussions with the governor's office to acquire 528 from the intersection of 520 all the way to the port. So if those discussions go as I presume they will, you have another ally, um, one, because I'm on the board, and two, because CFX will be in ownership of that section. And believe me when I tell you that we have an awful lot of money. Good to know, Kurt. Good to know. Let us know what we can continue to do to help you move that forward. We'll do it. Jason, anything to report? Good morning, Council. I, I just wanted to uh, introduce myself um, and maybe give a brief update from, from DEP. Uh, I am the uh, director of the Southeast District Office of, of DEP based out of West Palm Beach. Uh, Aaron is uh, the Central District Director based out of Orlando. And uh, it just occurred to me not long ago that I'm, I'm an alternate member on this, uh, on this board. And um, it appears that Aaron hasn't skipped a meeting in a long time because this is my, my very first uh, NEP meeting. And uh, Aaron uh, apologizes for not being able to be here today, but he called me this morning on his way up to the Smoky Mountains with his family and uh, wanted to make sure I was prepared and ready, ready to go for the council meeting. I said, don't worry, man, I'm good. I'll be all right. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, I, I just wanted to, um, to let, let the council know a little bit about what's going on with DEP. Um, earlier this month, uh, Governor DeSantis was down in Juneau Beach at the Loggerhead Marine Life Center, uh, signing two of the most important pieces of environmental legislation from this year's session. Uh, one is uh, Senate Bill 712, known as the Clean Waterways Act, and of course, House Bill 1091, uh, the Environmental Accountability Bill. Uh, the signing of these two bills represents some of the most comprehensive environmental legislation our state has seen in decades and will continue to provide momentum to the full-fledged environmental movement we've been building in Florida. Uh, Dr. DeFries had also mentioned earlier a little bit about that $25 million that's now available for Indian River Lagoon projects, thanks to the legislature and Governor DeSantis. Um, the RFP is being administered through St. John's Water Management District, but um, it's available lagoon-wide. Um, and I did want to just make one last point about uh, the benefits of working from home. I think it was Commissioner Smith that might have brought up the buff before. Uh, you're right close to your closet sometimes when you're working from home. So if no one knew what a buff was, I do have a buff here. These things are fantastic. <laughs> and also these... Um, these, these wonderful uh, long sleeve sportsman shirts. This is actually a, a Lake Worth Lagoon uh, uh, shirt here that I have that I know Carolyn will appreciate. We're both uh, you know, within walking distance from Lake Worth Lagoon, but these shirts are fantastic. The buffs are fantastic and uh, they've got my vote. That's all I have for the council. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Jason. Well, while we do miss Aaron, it is a pleasure to have you with us and maybe he'll miss a couple more or them so you can come back again. That would be fantastic. I actually have four counties in Indian River Lagoon. He only has two. So I'm going to arm wrestle him for more uh, frequent participation when he gets back. <laughs> I love it. There you go. All right. Commissioner Wheeler, anything to report up in Volusia County? Yes, just briefly. Um, for us, it's all education, testing, and action. In education, the Marine Science Center in Ponce Inlet, their biggest IRL-related improvement has been the creation of a new seagrass exhibit that educates the public on the importance of seagrass habitat to the healthy Indian River Lagoon ecosystem. And then we go to testing, uh, water quality sampling of the Indian River Lagoon, Volusia County's environmental management monitors, a total of 25 sampling stations in Mosquito Lagoon, from Oak Hill to Ponce Inlet, there's 10 sites. And north in the Halifax River to Bulo Creek, and there's 15 sites. 
covering a distance of 50 miles. And the data is gathered on a monthly and bi-monthly basis at, at different locations. And we have spent over 1,500 days gathering data and collecting samples at these locations. And that's equivalent to being on the water every day for four years. And that would be our testing. And then our action items would be the Gabordi Canal at 10th Street Stormwater Treatment Facility project. And this project is identified with the Mosquito Lagoon Reasonable Assurance Plan as a project that will contribute to the reduction of nutrient loading into the Mosquito Lagoon. And that's just a quick summary of our education testing and action plan. That sounds awesome. You guys are doing a lot of work up there. That's fantastic. Um, I just have briefly, I'm kind of like Commissioner Zadowski, I probably have stuff to update on, but it's kind of leaving my head at this point. Um, but we did just start a only rain down the drain public awareness program in Indian River County. So we have some local artists that have been going around and painting all of our stormwater drains. Um, each different neighborhood is like a different theme, but it's the same message across all of them, only rain down the drain, just trying to remind people not to all, all canals and all drains lead to the lagoon. So anything we can do as far as public awareness and education is always a good thing. And when you can add public art into it as well, it brings a little extra attention to it. So other than that, um, that's all I have to report. Our next council meeting is going to be November 6th, 2020 from 9.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. This will be in the city of Sebastian Council Chambers um, and Sebastian. All fingers crossed that we're able to do it that way um, at that point. So that's what we're planning on. If anything changes, we'll certainly let y'all know. And everybody, please stay safe this weekend um, with, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce that name either, but the storm that's off the coast and hopefully continues to continue being further and further off our coast. But with that, unless there's anything else for the good of the order. Yes, Kayleen. Bob Yulovich has his hand up. Oh, yes, Bob. Hang on, I'm un unmuting you. Hang on. There you go. I love this power that we wield over Mr. Yulovich here, but go ahead. Stop it. So uh, I'd be remiss not to to state appreciation for Kayleen, uh, how she manages this this group. But our management board managing that group is 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 fuel for late night comedy. Uh, many of us, myself, are in our seventies and electronically challenged, and you know the sub sub conversation would be uh, am i on mute am i mute where's the kids uh get the dog you know it's it's comical at times but kayleen manages to keep us all together despite all of our annoyances and all our interruptions so i would be remiss that this meeting ended without a special note of appreciation for all that she does thank you Thank you, Bob. It's definitely a group effort, though. We work very well as a team. And because you see me on the front end, there's a lot going on behind me with Kathy joining Daniel. So, but thank you. I appreciate it. Understood. Thank you, Madam very Chair. Very well said, Bob. Very well said. It, it does take a strong person to keep, <laughs> to keep us all together and moving forward as a group. So kudos to you, Kayleen, on that as well. And to all our staff. You guys are all awesome. And we really appreciate each one of you. All right, anything else for the good of the order? Seeing none, then we will stand adjourned. Thank you all. Have a great weekend. Thank, Thank you. you. Be safe. Be safe. Bye-bye. I'm going to close it so we can convert it. If you want to meet over on Teams, I'll be over there. <laughs>